In this video, I'll describe the basic purpose of blockchain technology. Blockchain is a relatively new technology, and I say relatively because it's been with us for a while, since 1990. So the idea wasn't new when the first blockchain was implemented around 2008. I'll get to that in a moment, but the main idea behind blockchain technology is that of a distribution system for information, a distributed database. And unless you've been living off-world the past few years, blockchain is considered to be transformational technology and experts are calling it disruptive for good reason. As the name suggests, blockchains are comprised of blocks. You can think of blocks as transactions, and those transactions are contained in peer-to-peer -peer networks. The contents of the blockchain database are determined by majority rule, and that's a simple majority of 51%. In transaction processing, all the nodes, or a majority of them anyway, reach agreement. And when agreement is reached, the transaction, a block, is stored to the database, the blockchain. Common transactions used in blockchains include payments, orders, and data records. The blockchain database is known as the ledger, and it's a distributed ledger, meaning that its contents are shared among the nodes of the peer-to-peer -peer network. Everyone on the blockchain network has a copy of the ledger, making it immutable in the sense that it cannot be tampered with. When everyone has a copy, it becomes virtually impossible to change everyone's copy, and that's what makes blockchain so attractive to developers and businesses. The blockchain is a complete list of records, and the blockchain keeps growing as new records are added to it. So the blockchain ledger contains all the records from the beginning of time to the present. I'll say it again because it's important to understand that blockchain is distributed technology. Users on a blockchain network can be anonymous in what's called a public blockchain, with everyone on the blockchain network having a copy of the ledger. Or in a private blockchain, users can be required to provide credentials, and only authorized users are allowed to have a copy of the ledger. There is good reason for both scenarios, and in fact, you can configure a blockchain network in a number of different ways. Blockchain is decentralized and terminology is important, so let's take a moment to consider the main differences between a centralized and decentralized network. In a centralized network, there is a central data source, let's call it the ledger because that's the name blockchain uses. Everyone draws upon that central ledger, ostensibly reading from and writing to it. The problem becomes that a central ledger is at greater risk of being corrupted or attacked because there's only one copy of it, a single target, and changing that single ledger affects everyone connected to it. In a decentralized scenario like blockchain, every user has a copy of the ledger. The ledger is read from, and it doesn't matter which one because they're all the same, and it's written to, but only if the majority of users agree on the right. Because of this, the decentralized ledger is less subject to risk of corruption or manipulation, and it can be said that altering a decentralized ledger for malicious reasons is a virtual impossibility, but I won't say that it's an absolute impossibility. Being decentralized isn't enough, however. Cryptography is still important, and blockchain uses hash functions to secure transactions, the blocks, as they're added to the blockchain. The two main hashing functions used by blockchain are SHA-256, and RIPE-MD. And every blockchain block contains a hash of the previous block, the transaction data, and a timestamp. Using hashes that chain back to each previous block makes the blockchain ledger very secure, and pretty much guarantees that the blockchain cannot be altered. And it provides non-repudiation, an important thing in business and computer security that ensures a party can't deny that something didn't happen. In this video, I'll discuss the history of blockchain from its beginnings to the present. Blockchain isn't a new idea. It was conceptually introduced in 1990 when Stuart Haber and W. Scott Stornetta wrote about the concept of a chain of blocks secured with encryption. In 1992, along with Dave Bayer, they added the idea of Merkle trees, which allowed blocks to contain multiple records. But it wasn't until 2008 that blockchain went from concept to implementation. And its introduction is as interesting as what happened next, because there's a mystery about how it came to be. Satoshi Nakamoto is the name used for a person, or a group of persons, we don't really know, to publish a white paper on a cryptocurrency based on blockchain. 
Satoshi Nakamoto also developed the first blockchain, and this, of course, is called Bitcoin. And while it wasn't the first cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is certainly the most well-known. Since 2008, there's been a crazy rapid growth of Bitcoin's blockchain, with it hitting 20 gigabytes in size by 2014, 30 gigabytes in 2015, and in 2017, Bitcoin's blockchain hit 100 gigabytes. But it's what happened to blockchain since 2014 that's most interesting, because for six years, it was the technology of Bitcoin, when it really was much more than that. Blockchain started to become the must-have technology, not a Bitcoin technology. New applications for blockchain technologies were identified, and in the past few years, organizations have scrambled to identify the way blockchain can provide solutions for real-world problems. Companies began developing their own solutions, and today, companies like IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon are only a few of the organizations to bring blockchain solutions to market. In this video, I'll specify the different companies and organizations that might benefit from blockchain technology. So, who needs blockchain? Do you? Does the company you work for? What about the companies that you interface with in your professional and private lives? Well, the short answer to all those questions is that any organization that relies on secure transactions should be interested in blockchain if they aren't already. And that includes, in no particular order, and a very abbreviated list, companies that make sales, financial transactions, or fintech companies, companies that deal with secure records, contracts, and any transactions that require or rely upon proof of ownership, organizations that need to focus on fraud avoidance, and anyone else interested in secure knowledge. It would take an exhaustive discussion to cover all the industries that are or will be affected by blockchain technology, so this is just a very abbreviated list. Industries affected by blockchain include law enforcement, banking, insurance and financial companies, the marketing world, transportation and logistics, human resources, the Internet of Things, the cloud, and the real estate industry. Early adopters of blockchain, that is, organizations that announced or launched development of a blockchain solution include the U.S. Federal Reserve, IBM, which has developed the IBM blockchain, Visa, and a number of stock markets across the globe, including NASDAQ and ASX, the Australian Securities Exchange. And a number of banks have taken the plunge into blockchain, including Citibank, UBS, Deutsche Bank, Barclays, BNP Paribas, and more. So, there's been a ton of hype over blockchain, and you might be forgiven if you haven't seen the appeal. After all, it is a data solution, and you have to be heavily vested in the data world and understand how this new technology works to see the light. But what's with all the hype, really? Is it that much of a game changer that you have to adopt it now or face the grim reality of becoming obsolete after all your competitors have a blockchain solution? Well, according to the Gartner Group, and this is interesting, only 1% of CIOs reported having a blockchain implementation, and 77% of CIOs reported having no plans for or interest in pursuing blockchain. So what gives? If the response of these CIOs is any indication, this transformational technology that's supposed to change the world doesn't appear to be living up to its reputation. And that begs the question, is blockchain overhyped, or is it really transformational technology that simply isn't quite ready for prime time? Where's the disconnect? Well, there could be a lack of understanding of the technology, and I don't want to suggest that CIOs don't understand blockchain. But the technology still confuses people, and maybe there's not enough critical mass inside organizations to reach the point where you know that you need it. Perhaps there's no value proposition yet. Companies recognize the value of the tech, but not as it pertains to their organizations. Or blockchain adoption may represent an unreasonable investment for the perceived returns. It seems to me that blockchain represents a paradigm shift, a major change in the way organizations and users implement technologies. And perhaps it's just not the right time for blockchain adoption en masse it still needs time to grow. And we can see this in the real world because blockchain talent is still very difficult to find. And we have to ask whether blockchain is a natural progression of things or does it require a forced change in culture? That is, do people need to climb outside the box and accept the assessment and actions of so many companies? 
or should it grow organically, allowing blockchain to flourish or fade depending on the will of the people who decide its value? These aren't easy questions, and it's up to you to decide how or whether to build upon this fascinating technology and the groundswell of adoption that we're seeing at this very moment in time. In this video, I'll discuss some of the benefits of blockchain technology. Ask any blockchain expert what's most attractive about the technology, and there's a good chance that they'll lead with security. It's also very transparent, allowing users who participate in the public blockchain to hold a copy of the ledger. Blockchain offers non-repudiation, the idea that a party can't come back at a later date and say, I didn't do that. You can use the records in the blockchain to prove that they did indeed do that, and that's important in business and law. Blockchain offers integrity because the very nature of a decentralized database is that it all but eliminates the risk of corruption. It's the decentralized nature of blockchain that means it's less prone to attack. The blockchain can't be modified without group consensus. Simply put, you can't add to the blockchain without at least 51% of the network agreeing. And this is very important. The blockchain is immutable. Once a record has been added to the blockchain, it's there forever. You can't go back and change it, and that immutability is very attractive for all sorts of reasons. And it's trackable. You can track back through every block on the chain, every record right back to the beginning of time, the moment when the ledger was first created. So you have an immutable record of every transaction. The blockchain is more efficient and customer-centric. And transactions are immediate. In simple terms, when you purchase something, ownership is transferred the moment the transaction is recorded on the blockchain. This is one reason why the technology has earned the attention of industries like banking, logistics, real estate, and equities trading. Blockchain can also be very cost efficient for organizations for any number of reasons, but one that's commonly used is how blockchain eliminates the need for intermediaries, and that can translate into a lot of savings. And look, no list of benefits is complete without listing something that organizations don't always stop to consider. It's innovative. Everybody's heard about it or will soon, and even if they don't understand what it is, they do know that it's bleeding edge. There's a competitive edge, a psychological advantage of being first to market, and you may want to remember that if you need to give your decision makers an added push. In this video, I'll discuss some of the limitations of blockchain technology. Blockchain is certainly a transformational technology, and while there are many benefits to using it, it does also come with some potential drawbacks. It can be complex to implement in the sense that it's a whole new paradigm with a new vocabulary and a talent market that hasn't caught up with the industry. To operate most optimally, blockchain requires a large user base. And while the technology offers a great deal of security and integrity, it is prone to human error. Everyone understands the principle of garbage in, garbage out, and so it's important to understand that if you'll implement a blockchain, you can't do it willy-nilly. Especially with new technologies, you want to spend the time and money getting it right. And this one's a bit contentious, but there are security flaws, or at least one potentially major security flaw that I call the consensus of lies. You'll hear the term the 51% problem, and it's the same idea. Basically, a blockchain network adds blocks to the ledger when a simple majority, 51%, is reached. When 51% of the nodes agree that a transaction should be added, consensus has been reached and the blockchain is updated. However, it's been postulated that a blockchain network could be attacked by bots, let's say, enough bots that they have a 51% majority. In that instance, it's possible that the blockchain could be taken over to favor the bad actors. It's important to note that this hasn't happened, and it's only theoretical, but it is worth considering. And there are other considerations for blockchain's limitations. Speed, for instance, may be slow, and this all depends on how consensus is reached and how many nodes there are on the blockchain. But Bitcoin, for example, can only process seven transactions per second. And the cost can be prohibitive. To use the Bitcoin example, Bitcoin transactions cost 20 cents each, and as of 2018, the estimated cost of mining one Bitcoin is in the range of 530 US dollars and $26,000, depending on which country you live in. Now, that's an extreme example. Bitcoin has been around for 10 years and has a massive blockchain network. The energy costs related to mining Bitcoins is steep, but it's worth noting, depending on what kind of blockchain you wish to implement and the scope of the blockchain. 
In this video, I'll discuss the potential risks associated with blockchain technology. The anonymous blockchain model, where nodes on the blockchain network aren't known, has its own challenges. You can't let the users determine their identity or even know if their participation in the blockchain is legitimate. You can't control the distributed ledger because every anonymous user has a copy. That's the nature of blockchain. Now, it's worth mentioning that blockchain isn't about controlling the ledger. The ledger is protected by its baked-in security through encryption and by the consensus rule, which states that a majority of blockchain nodes must agree before any transactions are added to the blockchain. And organizations need to know their blockchain, meaning that good design springs from solid planning and a clear mandate. So a poorly contrived or implemented blockchain isn't going to fix itself automatically and become a thing of beauty. Its success begins at the foundation. Hiring blockchain talent is a big problem right now. The momentum of the technology hasn't yet caught up with the job market, and without that critical knowledge, implementing a blockchain solution can be risky. And there are potential security flaws, specifically what I call the consensus of lies. Because blockchain works on the consensus rule, it is conceivable that a blockchain could be overrun by bad actors that comprise at least 51% and therefore control the blockchain. But it's also worth noting that this hasn't happened yet and it's still only a theory. Deloitte has identified three categories of risk for companies that undertake a blockchain solution. Standard risks are essentially everyday risks, so not pertaining specifically to blockchain but still affecting its implementation. For example, tackling a blockchain project without having the proper expertise because there's a deficit in the talent market. Value transfer risk refers to the core functionality of blockchain which transfers ownership, whether Bitcoin, land deeds, equities, commodities, and so on. In the traditional business model, transfer of ownership was handled by central intermediaries and blockchain eliminates this need. They believe that the lack of a central authority may subject companies to new risks. And there are smart contract risks because in blockchain smart contracts, transactions which represent the elements of any business deal or contractual agreement are stored in the blockchain. There may be a risk in mapping these complex elements from the physical world to the digital world, potentially causing exposure. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain is used in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. To call cryptocurrency currency is inaccurate. Cryptocurrencies don't function as currencies. They aren't traded in global exchanges, and there's no physical paradigm for cryptocurrencies, although there are physical cryptocurrencies. You can, for example, purchase a physical Bitcoin, but its value isn't in the coin. It's in the ether residing in your wallet and on the blockchain. Venture capitalist Bill Gurley calls Bitcoin a store of value and does see it as a way of storing money, particularly in places that may be subject to socioeconomic or political strife. So let's talk about the underlying technology of Bitcoin, because of course its history is rooted in the blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain contains all Bitcoin transactions since day one, which is January 3rd, 2009. Transactions don't get recorded until they're actually added to the Bitcoin ledger, and this happens through consensus. Of at least half the network. Each block on the chain has a timestamp and the block is linked to the prior block by the hash of that prior block. The Bitcoin blockchain is safe because everyone has a copy of the ledger and Bitcoin is stored in wallets, software or hardware that contains the Bitcoins. And to be more specific, Bitcoins are stored in wallets as an address and a record of your transactions. From a cryptography standpoint, the address is a public key comprised of 34 characters and although it's public, nothing can be done without the private key, a 64-character key, which only you hold. The blockchain is a public ledger, and there's no central authority. Large banks have been experimenting with blockchain technology and are even implementing blockchains and cryptocurrencies. And here's how Bitcoin transactions work. A payer sends a certain number of Bitcoins to a payee. Let's say you're buying a pizza. You place the order and you pay the pizza maker for the pie. And that's actually happened, by the way. Someone has paid for a pizza with a Bitcoin. Then all nodes on the Bitcoin network receive a broadcast of the transaction. The transaction is validated, and once validated, it's recorded. At that point, the nodes on the network propagate the transaction to other nodes. The process of mining is used to perform the validation. Mining validates transactions. Blocks which contain transactions won't be added to the blockchain until validation is complete. The validation process involves complex problem solving, 
extremely difficult problems that require a large amount of CPU and other resources to be solved. That makes the Bitcoin validation process expensive. In the Bitcoin network, transactions are broadcast about six times an hour. Blocks are added to the blockchain, and the blockchain ledger is propagated throughout the network so every user has the same copy. This process prevents double spending, by the way, by ensuring that all nodes have a current copy of all transactions. Different software applications can be used with blockchain for mining and wallets, for example. And security is ensured because the sheer amount of computational power it would take to attack the database, the ledger, and keep up with its propagation. The larger the network, the more unlikely it is that this will ever occur. And while we talk a lot about Bitcoin because it was the first to use blockchain technology, there are plenty more. There are plenty of other cryptocurrencies, and here are just a few in no particular order. There's Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Primecoin, EOS.io, Namecoin, and Peercoin. And many more, because at last count, there were more than 700 cryptocurrencies using blockchain. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain is being leveraged in the healthcare industry. In 2017, IBM surveyed healthcare executives in 16 countries and discovered that 16% expected to have a commercial blockchain solution by 2017. More than half, 56%, expected to have a solution by 2020 and 6 in 10 expect to use a blockchain to help them identify new markets and establish a more secure storage and exchange of information. In the same survey, 7 in 10 health professionals expect to improve time, cost, and risk for clinical trial records, regulatory compliance, and medical records. And a report by Forbes in 2017 stated that blockchain will transform healthcare. It will disrupt healthcare to solve issues and create a common database of health information. The vision for healthcare and blockchain is better security, improved privacy, reduction of administrative overhead, greater focus on patient care, better sharing of important information like research, better drug and treatment therapies, and the hope that healthcare providers will be able to access information regardless of the underlying platform being used. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain is being leveraged in the insurance and banking industries. Financial services is arguably the most robust current application of blockchain technology, with insurance and banking being the most prominent. This makes a lot of sense because, first, banks and insurance companies have lots of money, but more specifically, they rely on information, security, and transaction processing, and these are the hallmarks of blockchain technology. The stars for the financial services industry, the key applications that have drawn their attention, are security, non-repudiation, and smart contracts. With blockchain, there are no middlemen, and this has a number of advantages, including reduced costs, and blockchain's secure and incorruptible nature make it perfect for the mitigation of fraud. According to Deloitte, in 2015, the venture capital investment in blockchain technology for financial services was $474 million, and we can safely assume that number has gone way up. In the insurance market, blockchain will be able to provide improved underwriter accuracy, enhanced risk assessment, better processing of claims, better claims decisions, multi-party contracts, greater transparency, and fraud reduction, so it's easy to see why the insurance industry wants blockchain. The banking industry is focusing on smart contracts, digital IDs, Faster transaction processing and settlement, for example, trading, and this is important because blockchain transactions by design affect real-time change of ownership. They see a reduction of excessive record keeping, a reduced need for intermediaries, and an improved global payments system. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain is being used in supply chain management. So why would companies be interested in blockchain for supply chain solutions? Well, there are plenty of good reasons. First, the modern supply chain is complex and companies are constantly in search of better and more efficient ways to move parts and products from suppliers to warehouses to the plant floor to shipping to the end user. Blockchain can improve logistics, making items traceable and more transparent in the entire process. There's the promise of improved operational efficiency better visibility, 
more robust security, asset tracking, and real-time validation. Blockchain solutions can provide better inventory management, fraud mitigation, reduced costs, particularly in shipping, and greater efficiency. The blockchain can provide better time efficiency, reduced loss, and less waste. Furthermore, blockchain can provide organizations with faster issue resolution and an elevated sense of trust both in the process and with external suppliers. Now that you've learned about blockchain and its history, it's time to put some of that knowledge to work. In this exercise, you'll describe blockchain. You'll explain what blockchain is, explain the benefits of blockchain, explain the risks associated with blockchain, explain blockchain's security features, and explain how the healthcare industry can benefit from blockchain technology. At this point, you can pause this video and answer these questions. When you're done, resume the video to see how I would answer them. Okay, so let's answer these questions. It's okay if you didn't answer them exactly the same way. First, explain what blockchain is. Well, it's a relatively new technology in the sense that it's only been around since 2009. It's a chain of blocks, a distributed database that uses a ledger to record transactions. It's very secure and it's immutable. Next, explain the benefits of blockchain. Well, it's secure, it's transparent, it offers non-repudiation and integrity. It's decentralized. It works on consensus. It's trackable. It's more efficient and customer-centric. It's immediate. It's cost-efficient. And it's innovative. Next, explain the risks associated with blockchain. Well, the anonymous model has its own challenges. It's difficult to vet the users on a public blockchain. You can't control the distributed ledger. Organizations need to know their blockchain. Hiring blockchain talent is difficult. And there are potential security flaws, specifically the 51% problem, what I call the consensus of lies. Next, explain blockchain's security features. Well, first, blockchain is secured using cryptography, typically either SHA-256 or RIPEMD. Every block on the blockchain contains a hash of the previous block, transaction data, and a timestamp. And the blockchain essentially is very secure. It cannot be altered. It cannot be copied. And it provides non-repudiation, basically meaning that parties can't deny that they did a thing. Finally, explain how the healthcare industry can benefit from blockchain technology. Well, first, it offers better security, improved privacy, reduced administrative overhead, more focus on patient care, the improved sharing of research, better drug and treatment therapies, and healthcare providers will be able to access information regardless of the underlying platform that they're using. I hope you found this exercise helpful. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain technology is applied in the real world. Blockchain used to be Bitcoin, sort of, but it's not anymore, and let me explain that. Until 2008, blockchain was merely a concept, but then the person or persons called Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper on how blockchain could be implemented, and subsequently created the Bitcoin blockchain, the first public blockchain, version 1.0. So, Bitcoin is certainly owed credit for being the reason why blockchain was implemented, and for the next several years, blockchain and Bitcoin were effectively synonymous. But things then began to change. Between 2013 and 2014, there was a break from Bitcoin. People began to realize that blockchain could be used for so much more than cryptocurrency, and at that point, things changed in a big way. The second public blockchain was Ethereum in 2015, and while it's known for smart contracts, Ethereum also has a cryptocurrency. The third public blockchain can be said to have unfolded after that with organizations everywhere in a multitude of industries building their own solutions. Blockchain adds transactions to the chain by processing problems. Once those problems have been solved, at least 51% of the network reaches an agreement on the problem solved and blocks are added, and this is called distributed consensus. But there are two main ways consensus is reached, and it lies in the nature of the problem being solved. The first method, called proof-of-work, is used to solve expensive computational problems, expensive 
in the sense that it takes a massive amount of computing power to solve the problems. But expensive can be taken literally too, because the electricity costs involved in solving Bitcoin's POWs is well documented. And it's like a competition because the first node or miner to solve a problem validates the transaction and is added to the blockchain, and that miner is considered to be the winner and receives a reward. POW is commonly used in blockchain processing, and Bitcoin uses POW. Proof of stake, or POS, which is the preferred method of Ethereum, is similar to POW, but the winner is selected using deterministic methods, things like randomness, age of the miner, and that means age on the network, wealth of the miner, and that means how successful they've been in the past. So it's more arbitrary than POW, and the miner is paid in transaction fees rather than a block reward. So let's turn to smart contracts. Unlike Bitcoin, Ethereum can store information other than Bitcoins and their owners on its blockchain. The focus of Ethereum is on smart contracts, which allow parties to eliminate the middleman, lawyers, notaries, brokers, and so on. Smart contracts can be used for anything of value, so real estate, cash, commodities, pretty much anything that can be owned. The smart contract defines specifics on the agreement, things like terms, penalties, and other contractual obligations. The attraction of smart contracts is that they automatically bind parties to a contract and transactions are instantaneous. We're still discovering new uses for blockchain and will be for some time to come. And here's a small sample of blockchain uses that have currently been identified. Proof of ownership is a big one with things like smart contracts, trading of equities, bonds, titles, and so on. Customer loyalty programs, which typically store points that can be redeemed for value. Digital assets is another good one, and an early example of digital asset storage is the Interplanetary File System, or IPFS. And digital identification, things like passports, certificates, and OneName, which is a decentralized identity system using the Namecoin blockchain. And unsurprisingly, blockchain has been identified for uses that combat global strife and work toward a better world for everyone. BitPesa is a digital currency exchange that's being used to fight poverty in Africa and developing countries. The United Nations currently provides aid to Syrian refugees using the Ethereum blockchain. Follow My Vote is an organization that fights voter fraud across the globe using blockchain technology. And there are new and ongoing examples of the ways governments are using blockchain to provide public value through the sharing of information, health records, and numerous other applications. In this video, I'll describe the steps involved in creating a Bitcoin transaction and adding it to the blockchain. When someone wants to purchase or sell Bitcoins, they access a Bitcoin exchange, either through proprietary software or a web interface. The transaction is requested. I want to buy a pizza for a 10,000th of a Bitcoin, let's say, and I haven't checked the price of Bitcoin recently, so I don't know if I'm getting a good deal or not, but let's go with that. The sender makes the request, which is signed by your private key, and the request goes to the recipient. At this point, a digital signature is created using your private key and the transaction details, and the request is propagated to all the nodes on the network. The nodes compete to solve the problem they've been given using a method, usually proof of work or proof of stake. The first node to solve the problem then broadcasts its results to the network, and nodes validate the solution. What's interesting and pretty cool about blockchain is that using your public key and the generated signature Anyone can validate your ownership of Bitcoin, ensuring that you own the Bitcoin and that you're not trying to double spend it. Once consensus, more than 50% of the network agrees on the solution, the transaction has been validated, and the transaction becomes part of the block being added to the blockchain. The new block includes a hash that matches a hash in the previous block, ensuring that this is a valid block in the blockchain. At that point, the recipient, the pizza shop, now has the Bitcoin and it no longer belongs to me. But I'll get a tasty pizza out of the deal and hopefully I haven't paid too much for it. In this video, I'll discuss the different types of blockchains. Blockchain isn't just a single solution. There are ways to configure a blockchain so you can control how it interacts with others. So there are really four main types of blockchains. The first is a public or permissionless blockchain, which is open to everyone, meaning that its users are generally anonymous. This is the most well-known type of blockchain because both Bitcoin and Ethereum use public blockchains. 
The next type is private or a combination of public and private, so hybrid. And that's a restricted blockchain, meaning that users must have permissions in order to participate. A private blockchain is still decentralized, but not until a user has gained access to the network. So some sort of access control is provided and permissions can vary. An example of a private blockchain is multi-chain, an open source blockchain that organizations can deploy. In the hybrid model, there could be a combination of public and private, where some users have read-only access while others have write access. In the federated or consortium model, the blockchain is restricted through access control, like the private model, but the difference here is that the blockchain is comprised of groups, which could be separate entities, thus the consortium moniker. It could be banks or insurance companies, the idea being that the organizations which operate in the same industry space can form a consortium. Then there's public permissioned, which is similar to the public model with the exception that users aren't anonymous and instead are given access through credentials. An example of this model is Hyperledger, which is an open source collaboration project created by the Linux Foundation and designed for the enterprise. So let's drill down a bit. The public blockchain is open to the public. Everyone has a copy of the ledger. Users are anonymous and can read and or write to the blockchain. Anyone who participates can write to the blockchain. The public blockchain is slower than private or federated blockchains, and the public blockchain is secured by proof of work, proof of stake, or another method for validating new blocks. The private blockchain model is an isolated model. It requires an invitation to join and access is permissioned either through network access or a set of rules. Unlike the public model, all participating nodes are known to the network, and therefore the nodes are trusted. Enforcement of the blockchain and its transactions is achieved through access permissions and contractual obligation. The private blockchain is faster than the public blockchain. The private hybrid model is a mix of public and private blockchains and access is controlled. It's a useful model for organizations that wish to provide access to third parties. A company could provide read access to its customers and certain suppliers while providing write access internally and to other suppliers. It's generally thought of as a collaborative model and it's faster than the public blockchain. The federated blockchain is a group of private blockchains with restricted access. It's useful for groups of organizations like banks, insurance companies, energy providers, industry groups, and NGOs. So it's a collaborative model. It's also scalable, reduces overhead and duplication, offers lower transaction costs than legacy systems, and it's faster than the public blockchain. In this video, I'll discuss various blockchain platforms. Back in 2009, there was only one blockchain, and that was Bitcoin, which of course is a cryptocurrency. After that, blockchains began to appear everywhere, and this is a list of the different platforms out there. It's not by any means complete, nor is it in any particular order. Ethereum went live in 2015 and focuses on smart contracts, as well as having its own cryptocurrency. Blockstarter is a platform for initial coin offering or ICO campaigns. BigchainDB is a blockchain big data distributed database. Chaincore is a private blockchain for transferring financial assets. Domus Tower offers transaction settlement in regulated environments. HydraChain offers permission distributed ledgers for private and consortium blockchains and is based on the Ethereum platform. Hyperledger Iroha is a blockchain focused on mobile app development. Multichain provides multiple asset financial transactions and is based on the Bitcoin platform. NXT is a decentralized asset exchange that allows you to register multiple cryptocurrencies. Kick ICO provides ICOs and crowdfunding. OpenChain is an open source blockchain for digital asset management. Raiden is a scalable Ethereum platform. ShipChain offers a distributed ledger system for shipping and logistics. Unicorn provides esports betting. Token offers AI driven gift giving. Hero is a blockchain for prototyping and proof of concept. SkewChain offers supply chain tracking. Then there's OpenBazaar, which offers goods and services without the need for an intermediary. BitGive offers services for charity organizations and programs. Loyal is a universal loyalty program framework for retailers and members of loyalty programs. 
And Storage.io provides a distributed system for the encrypted sharing of free hard drive space. In this video, I'll discuss the Internet of Things and how it's used in everyday life. IoT is the Internet of Things, but I want to make a distinction here that it's becoming the Internet of Everything. So, the devices people use every day, machines, appliances, vehicles, and even living beings, they're all connected through the Internet. They're connected through software, electronics, Internet connections, and sensors, and for the most part, it's transparent. We don't really know what's connected out there. We know that there are security cameras on the streets and devices that sit and listen for us in our homes and with each passing day the amount and scope of connectivity is growing so is iot a quality of life improvement is it a game changer well the quick answer to both questions is yes but we need to stop and think about iot in terms of its core functionality the sharing and moving of data so iot is the sharing and moving of data does that make it ideally suited for blockchain? And how might that work? How might blockchain improve upon our connectivity? Well, we need to think about consumer IoT versus industrial IoT because there is a difference. Consumer IoT represents all the end products that people use or at least subject to. Industrial IoT is the machines and systems that produce the products that we use. There's a slight distinction there and it's worth noting. So what could blockchain bring to the game? Better communication, more secure transactions, improved security, smart contracts, greater consumer trust, non-repudiation? Well, the answer is all of the above and more. In this video, I'll discuss how IoT is transformational technology that will change the way we live, and also discuss the problems that arise from it. How can IoT leverage blockchain? There are billions of devices connected in ways that we simply couldn't conceive of 20 years ago. And if you think we're done finding new ways to connect the world, you may want to reconsider. We're constantly seeing more devices, more uses, and multiple platforms and architectures that are often ad hoc. That is, 20 years ago, no one really thought, hey, I need my fridge connected to the internet. No, of course not. A fridge was a device used to keep things cold, period. Same with cars. A car was a vehicle used to transfer yourself from one place to another. 20 years ago, no one would have thought, hey, I need my car connected to the internet, because that didn't fit the paradigm. But things have changed significantly. We have to consider the possible problems that may arise from so much connectivity. I'd like to think of it in terms of the Internet of Trusted Things, or IOTT, because anyone who knows anything about security knows that the risk grows exponentially as your attack surface grows. And while we've grown accustomed to spending time securing our desktop or laptop or tablets and phones, who really spends time securing their televisions or refrigerators? So we have to trust those devices to keep us safe, right? Well, IoT will transform, or has already transformed, the places where we live. In our cities and homes, we've become interconnected, and IoT will affect everything we make and do. Industrial IoT seeks to improve the way things are made or done, and even seemingly benign activities like urban planning are being affected by IoT. Not only will IoT transform the places in which we live, it will also transform how we live. It already has. But here's the problem or problems. Manufacturers are conceiving new uses for connectivity all the time. Wireless transceivers have become so small and cheap you can fit them in practically anything today. And vendors are taking advantage of that, but there are thousands of vendors out there and billions of devices being made with some sort of connectivity. Security has become a real issue. We don't know whether every vendor out there has the same commitment to protecting us, and it only takes one sloppy or disinterested vendor to cause problems for all sorts of people. Do we know how bad it could get? I don't believe we do. We can imagine how bad it could get, but these times are unprecedented in human history. Do vendors and organizations care about our security and privacy? Well, we have a good idea if the sheer number of security breaches is any indication. We hear about them all the time, and the response is normally reactive rather than proactive. What about a lack of standards? IoT really has become about anything that can connect, everything. There are no standards that encourage companies to protect you from your pen, your golf ball, your TV, or your fridge. It's all so nascent, so new. So what's the answer? Well, maybe it's blockchain.
In this video, I'll discuss security issues related to IoT and how IoT can use blockchain technology to be more secure. How can the Internet of Things leverage blockchain to secure devices and bolster trust? Clearly, better security is something that's needed. We've heard accounts of compromised devices at the OEM level, devices that ship from the plant to the consumer already infected with malware like keyloggers. That's actually happened, and stories like that do little to harden consumer trust. And we can see why things like this happen. There are few to no standards or regulations that enforce security. It's probably because at the design level, little thought given to an individual device's security. An industrial designer designs a fridge and puts a tablet on the front door. The software developers create the interface and software. But what's their motivation to put in anything more than that? More than the most basic security measures. Now, I'm not saying that they don't want to make it secure and that they don't try to make it secure, but every vendor is different. Pressures are to make something that consumers will want to buy, and in some cases, badly behaved devices or devices going rogue will reach the marketplace. There may be data tampering in instances where malware has inadvertently reached the device. And what about vendor integrity? We simply don't know if every vendor out there has an equal interest in your best interests. And think about this. We may not even know if a device we own is connected. It's not a huge problem right now because typically wireless devices will need a connection to an access point and that usually requires user intervention. But it is conceivable that devices will be able to automatically connect to cell towers now or in the future without our knowledge. It's not far-fetched. And then there's the user at the user level who wants to or knows how for that matter configure every device that connects to the internet. I have a ton of devices in my home that would connect to the internet if I let them. I lock most of them down at the router level, and if I need a certain device to have connectivity to the outside world, I'll give it access on a case-by-case -case basis. But who does that? Your, your average consumer probably doesn't think of doing that. Then you have to consider hackers, because even though vendors may inadvertently cause a device to become infected, hackers will overtly try to infect you, and they'll always go through the path of least resistance. And they have an arsenal at their disposal, botnets, devices that listen or watch, and in some instances where they've gained access to a physical network, devices peripherally connected to a network. And to make matters worse, in a sense, very large-scale integration has led to small, inexpensive components like transceivers. This leads to cheap connected devices that are becoming ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And once they're out there in the wild, vendors can't pull them back. What's the point of recalling millions of devices that cost under $10? They could issue notices warning people that they're compromised, I suppose, and maybe that will help the people who see the warnings. And here's the other thing. As devices become smaller, cheaper, and more disposable, will people dispose of them? Is it conceivable that people will just toss devices in a box and shove them in a closet? Well, sure, as long as those devices have power and a connection, they're a security risk. Well, that was bleak, and I apologize for being the voice of gloom and doom, but there is a possible solution to what I consider to be the inevitable problems associated with IoT. Blockchain. The transformational technology we all hear about. Now, think about it. By design, blockchain is meant to deal with large numbers of transactions, and it's been tried and tested in that arena. It's also decentralized, meaning that no one person or party can take it over. It works with massive numbers of nodes, the kind of scenario we would see in an internet-connected things kind of world. It's scalable, so it grows nicely as needed. And perhaps most importantly, it's got great security features. So here's how I think blockchain can save IoT. And I should probably reinforce what I've been saying, that there's no clear sense that IoT needs to be saved right now, but I hope I've made a good case for the problems right around the corner. First, blockchain guarantees data. It's data integrity, pure and simple. It offers a secure decentralized database that needs consensus in order to be written to. It guarantees non-repudiation. New data has to be validated before it's added to the ledger. And the link between IoT and blockchain becomes even more important when we consider governmental and industrial applications. Cities and governments use connectivity for so many things now, from security cameras to traffic lights to sensors that control and monitor, power generation, water treatment, you name it. Simply put, sensors and embedded technology must be secured, and while I'm sure there is a level of security already in place, blockchain may be a better solution. Who knows? And device status, which is monitored in real time, 
can benefit from blockchain through things like issue resolution and contract enforcement. But I want to be balanced in my approach to this idea. Blockchain is not a panacea. It's not the miracle pill that will fix all our problems. There are things that have to be considered and dealt with. Blockchain requires massive processing power as it scales. 51% is a problem, and any implementation of blockchain has to be secure enough not to let 51% of the network be taken over by bad actors. And what about the vendors of the IoT devices? How can we ensure that they're implementing the blockchain in a way that's secure and not subject to compromise? What happens when vendors invariably resist putting their devices on the blockchain? So there have to be structures put in place, and changing standards or new standards will only complicate things, so that has to be taken into consideration. And finally, who will be the change agents? Who will take all this and champion it, drive it, make it a real thing? We certainly have lots of change agents driving blockchain, but the Internet of Things and the implications of a global blockchain solution will certainly be a daunting task. Work is already being done, and there are many applications of blockchain being used in and around the IoT world. Groups like the Trusted IoT Alliance focus on making IoT secure, and who knows, perhaps you're a change agent who will get the ball rolling. In this video, I'll discuss various real-world use cases of blockchain technology. There are proponents of IoT focusing on Internet of Trusted Things, or Trusted Internet of Things. And one organization that wants to ensure trust in IoT is the Trusted IoT Alliance. Their vision is for an IoT ecosystem by 2025, and they work in conjunction with developers and enterprises. So what are some of the common use cases for blockchain and IoT? How is blockchain being used? Well, first, there are secure or smart contracts. There's regulatory compliance, the supply chain, user identification and authentication, IoT backbone management, and on-demand sharing, to name a few. IBM has been putting a great deal of resources and effort into blockchain. There's the IBM blockchain and Watson IoT platform, and IBM is focused on bringing blockchain solutions to the enterprise. And I like their philosophy. They see blockchain as being consensus, where all parties need to agree immutability where the ledger cannot be altered, provenance for a complete record of assets, and privacy where access control ensures visibility. They consider four interesting use cases for blockchain, so let's take a look. The first is logistics for improved workflow and real-time visibility. This includes being able to track and validate container contents, electronic documents such as bills of lading, customs documents, and so on, transit tracking of shipments, the transfer and handoff of goods, and dealing with exceptional events as they occur. The second is asset, life cycles, and history, which considers parts history and provenance, the maintenance and repair history, damage events, and transfer of ownership. And think of the implications here for companies that deal in large and often critical pieces of equipment. It could be aircraft, construction equipment, telecoms, whatever. These assets have extremely long life expectancies, but they also require Ongoing maintenance and their operational efficiency is crucial to their owners. Being able to enhance that efficiency with the blockchain is a great use of the technology. The third use case is infrastructure management, and IBM uses FCAPs, Fault Configuration, Accounting, Performance, and Security, as a reliable model for blockchain and distributing the FCAPs capabilities across multiple administrative domains, whether they're in transportation infrastructure, energy, water, or other infrastructural domains. The fourth use case is in guaranteeing the safety and reliability of the food supply chain. Being able to track exactly when and where items were at any point in the supply chain, right up to and including the consumer's table, is one of blockchain's strengths. And every point in the food chain is trackable from farm to processor to distributor and retailer. By using the blockchain to secure the food supply chain, this can prevent compromise, contamination, and spoilage of food items. In this video, I'll discuss the importance of IoT security and why blockchain's secure nature can be used to improve IoT safety. So let's talk about securing the Internet of Things with blockchain, but first let's consider some of the key issues. 
According to Gartner, in 2017, there were 8.4 billion connected devices globally, everything from thermostats to cameras and fridges to TVs, cars, light bulbs, you name it. That's more than one device per person around the globe, and it's safe to assume that number will keep growing. But the technology is still nascent. There are no regulations or standards. And while consumers are adding more connected devices to their households, hackers are gaining knowledge, as they always do. IoT devices are becoming more susceptible now due to their size. They're becoming smaller and therefore typically cheaper and easier to acquire. And with each new connected device added to a household, the attack surface in our homes increases significantly. Let's face it, we can't even agree on the language we use to refer to the paradigm we're living in. Does adding a smart TV or fridge or thermostat to my house make my house a smart home? Seize Lynx, the Dutch entrepreneur and IoT expert, says that we can't even agree on the language we use, and I would suggest that's a common malady in a rapidly changing technological world. So how do we begin to secure the IoT? There's been plenty of discussions on this, and most experts believe that organizations that make IoT devices should prioritize security, work towards standardization, be transparent with the marketplace, focus on customer-driven development and quality assurance, provide timely maintenance, and collaborate with other organizations. And I dare say that most of that sounds like common sense. And here's the point, the aha moment, if you will. Most of this can be achieved through blockchain technology. Now that you've learned about blockchain in application and as it pertains to IoT, it's time to put some of that knowledge to work. In this exercise, you'll discuss blockchain in application and with IoT. You'll explain proof of work and proof of stake, describe smart contracts, explain the steps in a blockchain transaction, describe the types of blockchains, and explain how organizations can use blockchain to secure IoT. At this point, you can pause this video and answer these questions. When you're done, resume the video to see how I would answer them. Okay, let's answer these questions. It's okay if you didn't answer them the same way. First, explain proof of work and proof of stake. Well, both provide distributed consensus, but the difference is that proof of work, which is typically exemplified by Bitcoin, is expensive in the sense of computational problems. The first user to solve a problem validates the transaction and is added to the blockchain, and the miner receives a reward. Now, proof of stake, which is exemplified by Ethereum, is similar to proof of work, but the difference is that the winner uh, is selected using deterministic methods, things like randomness, age, and wealth, and the miner is paid in a transaction fee. Next, describe smart contracts. Well, unlike Bitcoin, Ethereum can store other information on its blockchain. So the smart contracts are used uh, in part to eliminate the middleman, things like lawyers and notaries. And it can store anything of value, so properties, money, commodities, equities, you name it. And the contracts themselves define the agreement, so the terms and the penalties are actually baked right into the smart contract that's on the blockchain. And it automatically binds parties to the contract, and transactions with smart contracts on the blockchain are instantaneous. Next, discuss, explain the steps in a blockchain transaction. Well, when someone wants to purchase or sell bitcoins, they access a bitcoin exchange and the transaction is requested. The sender makes the request, which is signed by your private key, and the request goes to the recipient. At this point, a digital signature is created using your private key and the transaction detail and the request is propagated to all the nodes in the network. The nodes compete to solve the problem they've been given using a method like proof of work or proof of stake. The first node to solve the problem then broadcasts its results to the network, and nodes validate the solution. Once consensus is reached, that is more than 50% of the network agrees on the solution, the transaction has been validated, and the transaction becomes part of the block being added to the blockchain. The new block includes a hash that matches a hash in the previous block, ensuring that this block is valid. At that point, the recipient now has the Bitcoin, and it no longer belongs to you. Next, describe the types of blockchain. While the first is public or permissionless, which is open to everyone, the next is private or hybrid, and that's restricted, and 
The idea here is that it's centralized and permissions can vary. So you could have a hybrid model where you have some people having write access, some people having read-only access. The next is federated or consortium, which is also restricted. That's group-led. Typically, it's run by groups of organizations, so different companies band together if they're in the same industry, typically. And it offers restricted access. And then there's public permissioned. And the idea here is it's just like a public blockchain, except that you require an invitation to join the blockchain, and you would have to provide your credentials in order to sign up. Finally, explain how organizations can use blockchain to secure IoT. Well, organizations that make Internet of Things devices should prioritize security, work towards standardization, be transparent with the marketplace, and focus on customer-driven development. They should focus on quality assurance, provide timely maintenance, and collaborate with other organizations. And most of this can be achieved through blockchain. I hope you found this exercise helpful. I hope you found this exercise useful. In this video, I'll discuss trust and how it applies to the use of blockchain technology. Trust has become more important than ever. Modern computing generates massive amounts of information. Uh, think, for example, about big data. Every day we use multiple devices to connect and communicate, to make comments and purchases, to search and contribute. Everything we do now creates more than a digital footprint. It's a set of tracks that we leave and are leaving all our activity as a trail of breadcrumbs that can be mined and analyzed. The technologies we use, I'll use the term IoT because I think we need to start thinking in terms of every device, not just fridges and TVs. Those technologies create meaningful data that companies can use to provide a better experience for users and, of course, analyze patterns and behavior. And that's great. Who doesn't want a better experience when we live our lives in this digital fishbowl? But what about the privacy and security of users? Where does that stack up in the priorities of companies that use our data? To bring that thinking home, would it surprise you to know that more than half of consumers lack confidence in online security? And you might be forgiven if you expected that number to be higher than 54%. Add to that fact that global IP traffic has tripled since 2013 and will double by 2021, and we can begin to see the problem facing vendors who collect data. More traffic, more people, more data, all point to a greater chance that security breaches will increase. And the mode of connectivity is changing, to no one's surprise. In 2015, Google saw more mobile searches than desktop searches, and that makes perfect sense because people don't have to be changed to their desks anymore to access global data. 57% of internet traffic is now coming from mobile devices. The bring-your-own-device enterprise market will be worth $73 billion by 2021, and while that represents a tremendous opportunity, it also begs the question, how will we secure all these devices and traffic in a meaningful and transparent way? Data breaches are on the rise, and to make matters worse, we're seeing evidence that it's not just your ordinary hacker. State actors are doing it too. The reason that this is worth mentioning is that countries have the resources to create effective teams of hackers, and that's a scary prospect. By some accounts, there have been 9.7 billion stolen or lost records since 2013. That's 207,000 records every hour, and only 4% of breaches were considered secure because encryption was used to protect the data being stolen. Now, that all seems to make a pretty good case for the importance of trust, but where does that leave us? Well, if given a choice, consumers will always trust established companies. But why? Because they choose to? Or is it because they have no other choice? Do we trust a company because its name is well known and its size is so large that we just take a chance that it will look after our interests? Who knows? What we do know is that consumers need assurances. In order to establish and maintain trust, companies need to inform users about how their data is being used and how their privacy is being protected. Are companies providing these assurances? Perhaps that will be the metric in the future by which consumers make their choices, opting for a company's transparency over traditional metrics like selection or cost. And where does blockchain play in this ever-changing paradigm? We know it builds trust and that businesses by now probably know of blockchain and they may even be developing their own blockchain solutions. But generally, consumers don't know what blockchain is. Maybe they will in the future. But while blockchain can be used to build trust, it probably doesn't help a company to broadcast that your data is now on a blockchain.
because that will likely have little effect on user confidence, at least for the time being. What will boost user confidence is the absence of data breaches, and maybe that's the only reason you need to consider a blockchain implementation. In this video, I'll discuss the current regulatory landscape and how it applies to the use of blockchain technology. Only 27% of Americans believe that IoT in the workplace should be regulated by the U.S. government. And maybe that's not surprising because who wants to have their personal devices regulated the minute they walk through the doors for work every day? Interestingly enough, that number increases to 48% for those working in IoT environments. Bitcoin, which is the most notorious, I guess, instance of blockchain, is on the radar of regulators and has been for some time. There's a number of reasons for this, not least of which is that the cryptocurrency has been extremely volatile, making huge gains and losses over short periods of time. Bitcoin's high prices make it more attractive to malicious actors, and more than 33% of Bitcoin exchanges have been hacked since the cryptocurrency's introduction in 2009. Losses have been massive in some cases, with more than $500 million lost in January 2018 alone. And black markets have given Bitcoin a black eye, with defunct sites like Silk Road drawing the attention of law enforcement. And of course, the 51% attack is a concern, although it hasn't happened yet. There's a reason why regulating Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is problematic. Although regulation is slowly catching up, Different countries have different regulations, and some countries have no regulations at all. Some countries have banned Bitcoin altogether or levied deep restrictions, and different governments and agencies regard Bitcoin in different ways. So developing regulations across borders for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is a difficult proposition. So let's take a look at examples of Bitcoin-related regulations in different countries. In 2013, the United States classified Bitcoin as a convertible decentralized currency. And in 2016, a federal U.S. judge ruled that Bitcoin should be treated as funds, just like any other fund. In 2016, Russia declared that Bitcoin wasn't legal, but in reality, Bitcoin remains blocked in that country. Canada has regulated Bitcoin under existing money laundering and terrorist financing laws, and banks won't allow the use of credit cards for Bitcoin transactions. In 2015, the EU ruled that Bitcoin was exempt from their value-added tax and that Bitcoin is not a commodity. In Bolivia, Ecuador, Bangladesh, Nepal, Macedonia, Bitcoin is illegal, so we can see there's a lot of discrepancies over how Bitcoin is treated by different countries, and that may change. But as long as the rules vary, it will continue to make regulators nervous and likely benefit those who wish to use the cryptocurrency for illicit purposes. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain technology has issues that need to be addressed. There's been a bit of confusion over what can be done with blockchain, with the initial response to the technology that it was merely Bitcoin because Bitcoin fueled blockchain's creation. But it's much more than Bitcoin, and what can be done with blockchain hasn't been fully conceived yet although much has been done in the past couple of years to prove blockchain's promise. But there's no standardization, it's not scalable enough, and it needs further development. And for some organizations, the infrastructure and adoption costs may be prohibitive. I'm going to blow your mind here and draw a comparison between blockchain and Betamax video. When Betamax came out, it was widely regarded by video files and those in the know as a superior technology to its main competitor, VHS. But Betamax struggled because it was new technology, just like blockchain. Sort of, because blockchain's been around as a concept since the early 1990s and as a proof of concept since 2009. People didn't understand why Betamax was better, and they hesitated. More people purchased VHS machines, and therefore there were more VHS movies at the video store, and the beta section was a tiny wall in the back corner of the store. Hesitation is a roadblock, and that may be why we're not currently seeing the uptake of blockchain in organizations. And on a good day, investor and consumer behavior is volatile. Like Betamax, consumers don't entirely understand what it is, why they need it, and in all likelihood, many CIOs have taken a wait-and-see approach while other organizations roll out their solutions to see if they make mistakes or uncover unforeseen issues with blockchain. 
And consider banks, which are arguably the most aggressive pursuers of blockchain technology. One of the reasons they may have jumped on blockchain so quickly is the threat of eliminating the middleman. Banks like to charge fees. That's a cash cow for them. And by controlling it, they can ensure that they'll continue to collect fees and maybe make more money when the intermediaries are removed from the process. Now, that may be a little cynical, but the eradication of the middleman may also represent a hurdle for some financial organizations that haven't figured out a way to crack that nut. And financial services organizations in general face many challenges. Blockchain may not be a priority if they cannot understand how to monetize it, and financial institutions tend to be traditional. Generally speaking, they aren't well known for driving innovation. So, blockchain really needs to go mainstream. It requires collaboration, more cooperation between organizations. We are seeing examples of collaboration with organizations like IBM and Hydrochain, creating solutions that can feed multiple organizations. But until wider adoption occurs, there will be more work to do. And that will be a problem for industries not accustomed to working together. There's no effective regulatory environment, and that's a bad thing if you like regulation, but not everyone does. Still, with a technology like this, there needs to be standardization and regulation to provide a foundation for the future of blockchain. To wit, the legislative and legal landscape needs to evolve. There are still unknown applications for blockchain, many I suspect, although what's been proposed to date is remarkable and encouraging. Bitcoin, smart contracts, and most of what we've seen so far represent the tip of the iceberg. And that's why change agents are needed, thought leaders are required, and a robust talent pool is critical for the widespread growth of blockchain. In this video, I'll discuss the reasons why blockchain challenges trust. According to Santander Bank, the banking world has much to look forward to from blockchain. The blockchain ledger could save banks $15 billion by 2022 and provide an immutable audit trail. Essentially, blockchain has the potential to eliminate fraud. And of course, fraud reduction is of great interest to banks. And blockchain could be used to perform credit checks and money transfers. And the ledger could report transactions in real time. Two organizations that are currently working on open source blockchain solutions are Chain and Hyperledger and the banking sector has put resources behind both. So banks are moving forward in a meaningful way to implement blockchain ledgers. But what about the consumer side? How will consumers benefit? Because that's half of the equation. Does blockchain mean there will be fewer fees? Or does beefed up trust through better security and privacy justify increased fees? And what happens if or when maybe something breaks? Does blockchain lose all credibility with consumers? Or will they even know that it's blockchain they have a problem with? Perhaps the bank's transition will be transparent to consumers, and consumers won't know that they've even been using a blockchain. Who knows? Nevertheless, trust has a cost to those building trust, the banks, and a cost to those who give it, the consumers. And banks know that for consumers, trust is easily revoked. So it should be interesting to see what happens, to see what solutions appear on the horizon as blockchain continues to take hold on the financial services industry. In this video, I'll discuss the reasons why blockchain isn't an all-encompassing solution. Trust is expensive to maintain, and even with the promise of trust, there simply are no guarantees. Consumer trust has been shaken over the past few years, with widely publicized data breaches shaking the foundation of trust that organizations strive to build. And look, for some organizations, building trust is an unwanted task because it's time-consuming, it can be inefficient, and it gets expensive. And consumers are expressing their displeasure with the way their data is handled, with 54% stating that they're not confident that their data is secure. This is why blockchain has drawn the interest of multiple sectors, but is it the solution that will restore consumer trust? Blockchain's potential is undeniable. The public ledger is transparent and intermediaries are effectively removed, providing a cost benefit and a trust benefit simply because there are less parties involved in transactions, less moving parts. And transparency builds trust. People are going to be far more willing to give an organization a chance if they can see what's happening with their data. So how the technology is applied is more important than the technology itself. And while that may be a bit difficult for some to accept, from a practical standpoint, technology works because we use it. Many years ago, I read about Comdex. Uh, I believe it was in the mid-1990s. And 
The author described a discussion he had with two engineers from a tech company. They were displaying their latest product offerings at the booth, but they took the author behind the booth and showed him a 486 PC with a full-sized card inside it and explained that the card turned the PC into a server, similar to the servers that they sold for tens of thousands of dollars. When the author asked why they weren't demoing the card for the public, they explained that the card would only sell for a couple of thousand dollars, and so there was no way the company would ever commercialize it because it would compete with far more expensive systems. I understand the rationale, but my point is that technology only works if you use it. And look, companies already have mechanisms in place to protect your data and privacy. To many, that's enough. So why would you want to mess with that? There's a danger of moving to a new paradigm, at least to those who didn't have a problem with the status quo. But if organizations do move toward blockchain to improve their bottom line, improve security, improve customer confidence, and there's plenty of evidence that organizations are moving there, how successful will these organizations be? That remains to be seen. Blockchain isn't rocket science, and neither is its implementation. The idea of securing information and establishing trust isn't a new idea. It's as old as time. Before digital computers, we still needed to protect information. Banks used to have a card catalog, and when you went to your branch to make a withdrawal or deposit, you had to sign a form and the teller would go over to the card catalog and pull your signature and compare it with the document you just signed to ensure that you were who you said you were. Information protection isn't new, and in many ways, we've gotten quite good at it over the centuries. So what builds trust? Well, I see four pillars. Truthfulness transparency, accountability, and reputation. And organizations with the highest levels of consumer confidence generally tick off all four boxes. They're honest about their activities. They don't try to hide it. When something goes wrong, they admit it and strive to do better. And they understand the importance of reputation as a metric that determines success. With blockchain, the organizations that will be successful are the ones that implement the technology well, and that just makes sense. In terms of on-the-ground implementation, what are successful organizations doing to build trust? Well, there are three primary things. First, they have a chief security officer, a CSO. They conduct product and service risk evaluation on an ongoing basis for both customers and partners. And they conduct proactive testing, choosing to test before a problem occurs rather than after. In this video, I'll discuss the reasons why designers should consider the adoption of blockchain technology. Designers need to start thinking about blockchain if they're not already. Why is that? Well, first, it's way more than Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, so the current design models probably won't work. If you're designing a platform for an insurance company, it probably won't look much like a Bitcoin wallet. Next, blockchain will change the way we interact. In many ways, it's a completely different paradigm than what we've seen before so design is more important than ever. So, blockchain is more than cryptocurrency, and yes, Bitcoin was the first implementation. It was the proof of concept, in a sense. And we have Bitcoin to thank for blockchain awareness, so there's a synergistic relationship between the two. And it wasn't long before other cryptocurrencies, many others, appeared. So now we've witnessed nearly 10 years of blockchain in action, and to be honest, the results are mixed because cryptocurrencies have had their share of problems. So does cryptocurrency tarnish blockchain? And to me, the answer is a resounding no for two reasons. First, blockchain is not Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. It's its own distinct technology. Second, of all the problems that have occurred surrounding Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, blockchain has never been the problem. It's never been hacked and it's never failed. So we can be confident that blockchain's technology is solid. And we're seeing it now because new use applications have appeared, applications that have nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. The takeaway here is that cryptocurrency may or may not survive, but blockchain is here to stay. The way we interact is changing. Privacy and data security trust is more important than ever before. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. New technologies are making data protection more difficult. The Internet of Things and artificial intelligence are changing the way we communicate and the way we process information and make decisions. And they're both relatively nascent, so we haven't had a chance yet to see how these may impact data security. Nearly 90% of companies are using AI in their cybersecurity strategies, and more than 90% of cybersecurity professionals have concerns that hackers will try to attack their systems using AI. 
Blockchain is the new technology that may be the natural evolution of the ways we interact, though, providing greater efficiency, improved trust, and the possibility of more usability. But like all good technologies, it should be relatively invisible to the end user, with the interface determining the usability. And that's the point. Designers know that the human experience has always been the end game. The technology has never been responsible for usability. Designers are. All blockchain is, ultimately, is the back end. So how can designers improve the front end? And you know, it's nice to get caught up in the underlying technology of blockchain for designers that enjoy that. But at the end of the day, the user interface is king. In this video, I'll discuss the various considerations for designing blockchain solutions. Design is a fundamental tool in implementing any technology, and blockchain is no different. Generally speaking, the common design principles haven't changed with blockchain, but of course, the underlying technology is, and the paradigm is different. The way things are processed and transacted are different, and, and it's up to a designer to determine how to present that to the user. There are some helpful principles that you can adopt when designing blockchain apps. First is data visibility. That can be very important to a blockchain application. For example, you can go to any number of sites that track cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and get real-time information about the status of the blockchain. The ability to audit that information is an important facet of blockchain design. Information feedback is important with items like progress timelines and a summary of blockchain data, again in real time. Interactivity, of course, with visualizations and dashboards. And fluff is never a good thing in a user interface. It's confusing and just adds to an application's overhead. And it's important to be consistent both visually and experientially. There should be a common element of consistency in the layout of pages, the look and feel of buttons and icons, colors, and typefaces used. And be modular, creating reusable elements for greater efficiency. And you should adopt design standards, conventions, best practices, as you would with any other project. You may have to adhere to regulatory obligations, not for blockchain necessarily, which doesn't have any regulations, but for things like WCAG and Y-Area and other regulations and standards surrounding usability and accessibility. And of course, you should adhere to a responsive design so users can use your app on a phone, tablet, laptop, or desktop. You should consider international usability, paying attention to internationalization and languages. So like any other app, you need to understand who will be using it. Wherever possible, think about building trust. Remember that if you're working on a blockchain, you're probably dealing with data that needs to be secured and kept private. So keep in mind that anything you can do as a designer to impart that security and safety to your user will go a long way. In this video, I'll describe the various deficiencies of designing with blockchain. Designing apps for blockchain is different than the usual paradigms, so let's dig into exactly why that is. First and foremost, trust is absolutely crucial for the success of a blockchain. Whether you're sharing private electronic records or storing purchases, a blockchain needs to be locked down in the eyes of the user. The experience has to be more human-centric due to the nature of blockchain and its uses. And users tend to adopt things slowly when trust is a factor. And trust is even harder to come by. So your job as a designer requires a fair amount of empathy, putting yourself in the user's shoes and understanding what's important to them and what will give them confidence. Here's the problem. We're at point A because blockchain is still, relatively speaking, nascent. Even though it's been out there as Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, one might argue that it hasn't helped and maybe even hindered blockchain's reputation because it's natural to associate blockchain with cryptocurrencies and therefore their problems have become blockchain's problems. There are plenty of difficulties when designing for blockchain. It's easy to forget the end user when you're focusing on the technology, especially a new paradigm like blockchain. And with blockchain, users take control. They run the ship and you have to be apprised of that. Removing middlemen has its disadvantages too. Intermediaries are often needed because they provide specialized knowledge or credentials. Lawyers are the experts in law, and notaries are credentialed to professionals. And without those, as it might be in a blockchain scenario, there's a gap that might confuse a user or hinder a transaction. And look, too much information can be a bad thing. It's one thing to empower users, but give them too much, and it may overwhelm or create chaos. 
That's why it's probably a good idea to avoid giving non-essential information, perhaps making it available as a helper. The same goes for fluff. Animation and fancy interfaces are pretty, but if they hinder functionality or usability, then they should be avoided. It helps to maintain consistency, and that goes for any user interface. And you should also focus on feedback, both internally and from testers and users. It can be invaluable for rebuilding and tweaking designs. In this video, I'll discuss the importance of user experience design. If you think like a designer, then you're probably aware of the old thinking, content is king. That's not necessarily true in the modern paradigm, particularly with blockchain, where the user experience is king. Designers should focus on the user experience and the mobile experience first, especially in fintech applications where it's easy to get lost in charts, graphs, graphics, and numbers. Foremost should be transaction status, which should be front and center. And keep in mind that blockchain can take longer when processing transactions. It's not always instantaneous, and so you need to find a way to keep a user reassured that things are working the way they're supposed to. So what about the app itself? Should there be a single app or many? That really depends on the scope of the functionality you'll want to provide. The supporting cast needs to be well thought out too, that is, plugins and add-ons, and that's particularly relevant if you've got third-party add-ons. If you use cryptocurrency as part of your blockchain solution, do you provide wallets or rely on the ones already out there? And you need to pay attention to news feeds and live updates. Check out what cryptocurrencies are doing with live updates on their blockchains. And news feeds can provide a sense that things are happening and working in real time. And if users are coming in from originating websites or their component transactions, things like transfers and purchases from someone else's shopping cart, for example, then consider how you can design your transaction interface so it doesn't add confusion to the user experience. Before you know what you're designing, know who you're designing for. That requires a lot of testing, but you also have to ask yourself, do users trust you? Do they trust the organization? Do they trust the other party they're interacting with? Do they trust the technology they're using? And do they trust the blockchain? You may not be able to convincingly answer these questions, but by thinking about it, you will be well equipped to provide a better user experience. So here are a few tips for designing for blockchain applications. Make your interface responsive by giving the users the ability to do, see, use, review, and update. Try to keep complexity down, sometimes less is more. Tied into responsivity, give users precise control over everything they do. Avoid trying new tricks with the interface. Fancy graphics are cute, but they don't help users. And most importantly, be consistent with your interface. In this video, I'll discuss the various job roles for blockchain in an organization. According to a 2018 Gartner study, only 1% of CIOs reported having a blockchain implementation, and 77% of CIOs reported having no plans for or interest in blockchain. But according to the Upwork 2018 Skills Index, blockchain is number one in the fastest growing skills for freelancers, with a 6,000% year-over-year growth. They call it the new cloud of the 21st century. Furthermore, there are more than 1,500 blockchain startups looking for staff on AngelList. So what gives? Why are so few CIOs planning a blockchain implementation when there appears to be a movement toward critical mass? I don't know the answer to that question, but we do know that software and fintech are the top industries right now for blockchain-related jobs. And here are some examples. IBM has more than 400 blockchain projects, more than 1,600 employees working on blockchain, and more than 150 blockchain-related job openings right now. Jim is working with the Centers for Disease Control on a project for blockchain-based outbreak data. Dubai is working to become the first state in the world powered by blockchain, and we know that there's a gap in blockchain education and the associated talent requirements. You can draw your own inferences, but it's safe to assume that there will be growth in blockchain training as well as job opportunities. As for specifics, here's what organizations are looking for. These are the top blockchain positions right now, according to businessstudent.com. Blockchain intern, blockchain project manager, blockchain developer, blockchain quality engineer, blockchain legal consultant or attorney, blockchain designer, and blockchain engineer.
Now that you've learned about blockchain trust and design, it's time to put some of that knowledge to work. In this exercise, you'll specify blockchain trust and design considerations for blockchain technology. You'll describe problems with Bitcoin regulation. You'll discuss blockchain's inherent problems. You'll explain hurdles to blockchain adoption. Explain why designing for blockchain is different. And discuss difficulties with blockchain design. At this point, you can pause this video and answer these questions. When you're done, resume the video to see how I would answer them. Okay, so let's answer these questions. It's okay if you didn't answer them the same way. First, describe problems with Bitcoin regulation. Well, the regulation is slowly catching up, and different countries have different regulations. Some countries don't have any regulations at all, and some countries have banned Bitcoin altogether or levied deep restrictions, and different governments and agencies regard Bitcoin in different ways. Next, discuss blockchain's inherent problems. Well, there's confusion over what can be done with blockchain. It's much, much more than Bitcoin, but maybe blockchain's potential hasn't been fully conceived yet. There's no standardization, it's not scalable enough, it needs further development, and infrastructure and adoption costs may be prohibitive for some companies. Next, explain hurdles to blockchain adoption. Well, first, it's new in a sense, although it's been around as a concept since the early 1990s. Uh, consumer hesitation and also the hesitation of companies can be a roadblock. Investor and consumer behavior can be volatile. Consumers don't understand and therefore may not trust blockchain. And banks like to charge fees. There may be the idea here that because of the elimination of the middlemen, the banks will have a problem with that, although the evidence that we've seen to date is that banks have been adopting blockchain in a big way, so that may not be an issue. Uh, and also, financial services organizations face many challenges. Uh, it may be the case that it's not a priority for some companies, uh, and typically banks don't traditionally drive innovation. But again, we are seeing some movement in the financial services industry with blockchain. Next, explain why designing for blockchain is different. Well, first, trust is crucial for blockchain to work. So you have to factor that into your design, and how do you do that? How do you build trust into a design? It has to be more human-centric, and users adopt fairly slowly, so you have to pay attention to that. Trust is harder to come by. It requires empathy, and here's the problem. We're still at point A with blockchain, where it's relatively young. So how does that affect the uh, behavior of users, and how do we take that into account when we're actually designing for the user? Finally, discuss difficulties with blockchain design. Well, first, it's easy to forget the end user when you're designing for something technical like blockchain, so you have to take that into account. With blockchain, the user takes control, so you have to make sure that you pay homage to the user when you're designing your interfaces. And removing the middleman has its disadvantages too, so you have to take that into account. And too much information can be a bad thing, so you have to be careful when you're providing information to users in an application not to give them too much, at least not in their face. You can give them the option to access it through helpers, but try not to put it out there in an overwhelming way. I hope you found this exercise useful. In this video, I'll discuss the basic concepts of developing blockchain solutions. Here's why now is the time to take on blockchain development. First, it's still relatively nascent. Although it's been the technology behind Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for 10 years, and there have been other implementations appearing on the scene, it's young in the sense that it's not widespread technology, and you still have the opportunity to be one of the many pioneers adopting blockchain today. It's much more than cryptocurrency, and we're seeing this everywhere with blockchain applications that have nothing to do with cryptocurrency. There's still a significant talent deficit, and that's the best sign that this is the time to get into blockchain. It may seem counterintuitive, but if there's a massive demand for the technology and not enough talent to fit the need, then that's an indicator that we'll see significant growth in training programs and certifications, and being a specialist now puts you in a good place. Innovation is industry-driven, and that's nothing new, but the true visionaries are the ones who recognize the opportunities and leverage it. So you have a chance to be one of those change agents. And just as a primer for new developers, there are a few concepts that you need to know if you're going to take on blockchain. First, the ledger is the data repository, the database itself. It's decentralized technology. There's no central authority, and that's part of blockchain's charm. It makes it more secure and less prone to tampering. 
It relies on consensus, the act of reaching an agreement, so at least 50% of the participants need to agree before a blockchain is updated. And mining is the process of adding blocks. If you wish to become a blockchain expert, here are a few skills you may want to have. Of course, there's cryptography, data science, networking, and distributed systems, all useful backgrounds for a blockchain developer. Other useful expertise that's not tech-specific but that may enhance your profile as a blockchain expert include game theory, economics, banking, insurance, and equities and commodities trading. I'm sure there are more, but these tend to cover what's being done with blockchain as things stand today. So where do you look if you want to expand your blockchain knowledge? Well, massively open online courses, or MOOCs, might be a good place to start. And if you prefer to stay away from coding, there are options. The IOLite project, for example, allows you to create smart contracts and blockchains with or without programming languages. It uses AI to convert natural language to intelligent code. And as for certifications, we're seeing plenty appear on the scene, but it doesn't appear that there's a clear standout quite yet. In this video, I'll discuss the various programming languages, development platforms, and useful skills that can be used for blockchain solutions. So, what computer languages can be used to create blockchains? Well, the good news is that you probably don't need to learn a new language if you know one already because there's a large number of common computer languages used in blockchain development or cryptography. These include C, C++, which Bitcoin is written in, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, Node.js, Python, and Perl. As for common development platforms being used to develop blockchain solutions, there's a growing list of options. Some of them include BigchainDB, ChainCore, Corda, Ethereum, Hydrochain, Hyperledger, Iota Tangle, and Stellar. Now, there are more, and whichever one you choose should be chosen based on its specialties and what it was intended for. Some are focused at the enterprise level, many are open source, and some have very specific purposes. For example, Ethereum is generally focused on smart contracts. Additionally, there are other useful skills that can complement blockchain developers. GPU programming, for example, which is typically going to be either OpenCL or CUDA. Experience with Apache Kafka for stream processing. Data science can be a helpful background. Certainly, if you know anything about Bitcoin development, that can enhance your skill set. Knowledge of the ISO TC307 standard can be extremely useful, especially in enterprise environments. It's the ISO standard for blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. Security may seem obvious, but having a background in IT security can really help. The same with cryptography and PII, or Personally Identifying Information Technologies. In this video, I'll discuss the open source nature of blockchain and how it can benefit organizations. Blockchain began as an open source construct. It was conceived in the early 1990s and then introduced as a proof of concept with a white paper and Bitcoin in 2008 and 2009. And while organizations have moved to commercialize blockchain solutions, there's still a sense that blockchain is a grassroots movement, in part because its use was almost exclusively for cryptocurrencies in the first several years. And in part because there's a robust open source movement inside the blockchain universe. And it's worth asking whether issues might arise from open source. Blockchain is focused on security, as one of its pillars, but does an open source paradigm threaten the security that makes blockchain so important? At least one organization feels that open source blockchain solutions could do more to improve security. Intelligence firm CAST studied 61 open source blockchain projects and 9 million lines of code. Interestingly enough, they found open source solutions to be 9% more secure and 10% more robust than commercialized applications but also that the open source offerings were 7% less efficient. The bottom line, the company concluded, is that more can be done by the open source community not only to improve efficiencies, but also to continue improving security. Notable public blockchains include Bitcoin, which of course needs no introduction. Ethereum is also well known and focuses on smart contracts, but also has a cryptocurrency. And Hyperledger is a collaborative project on the of the Linux Foundation focusing on open source blockchains and distributed ledgers. Private blockchains include Eris, which is a fork of the Ethereum platform, Multichain, a fork of Bitcoin that allows you to create your own private blockchains, 
and OpenChain is a blockchain technology that's well suited for enterprises. OpenChain is blockchain-like, so while closely related to blockchain, it's not, strictly speaking, a blockchain. In this video, I'll specify the basic concepts surrounding code creation for blockchain solutions. When you decide to develop a blockchain solution, you have a few key choices to make. First, you have to choose your target platform, either for the desktop, for the web, for mobile, or more typically two or three of the above. To use an example, wallets are the software used for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency transactions, and software wallets, because there are hardware wallets too, either come in the form of an app or a web interface. There are benefits and drawbacks to each, but you generally have to decide what works best for your users. Then you have to choose your connectivity. Will your software be constantly online or will it have offline components? Again, to use the Bitcoin example, there are Bitcoin wallets where you store your keys offline, essentially making it impossible to steal your Bitcoins. This form of cold storage may be applicable if you're developing a blockchain that deals with ownership of things like stocks, bonds, commodities, or of course, cryptocurrency. Next, you should choose your development platform. Generally, the two most popular language platforms are C++ and Java, although pretty much any of the common languages will do, but you should consider, if you're building on another blockchain platform, what language has been used. Bitcoin's blockchain, for example, is written in C++. Finally, you have to choose your blockchain platform. There is plenty to choose from, and considerations should look at what you plan on doing with the blockchain and whether it's going to be open source or a commercial application. Some examples of platforms you might choose from include Hyperledger Fabric, Ripple, and Solidarity, but this is just a quick list and you should invest time in researching the offerings out there before you commit to a platform. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to create a blockchain. Although blockchain is, relatively speaking, nascent, blockchain as a developed entity is pretty mature. It's been around for 10 years now, and thanks to a bunch of open source projects and individual efforts, you can build a blockchain with the help of tutorials and repositories. This one, for example, is a splendid tutorial on building blockchain with Python. And if I scroll down, there's a link here to actually check out the, uh, the repository, the code, source code for this on GitHub, and you can actually download and use it. Now, here's another one. This is a guide for creating blockchain with Java, and you can build it. Uh, you can actually code it step by step, so this is pretty helpful too. And you can, uh, and with a quick web search, you can find plenty of other useful resources as well. But the one I'm going to show you is multi-chain for a couple of reasons. First, it's an open source blockchain that's been around for a while, and organizations are free to deploy it. Multi-chain provides multiple asset financial transactions and is based on the Bitcoin platform and the source codes also available on GitHub. Second, here at Multi-chain site, you can download the software and be up and running in a matter of minutes. So the first step is to click the download link. Now, this will work on either Linux, Windows, or Mac, and the system requirements are right there. I'll scroll down a bit because I want Multi-chain for Windows. I'll go ahead and click the download link. And we're finished. I'll click open. And look at that. We've got our zip file. It contains five files, four executables, and one readme. And the readme contains uh, information that's useful for running the Windows version. And to install it, it's as simple as this. I'll uh, bring up uh, a new window here. And on my drive C, I'm going to create a new folder. I'll call it multi-chain. Go back to the zip file, highlight the five files, copy them over, and that's it. It's installed. So now that we have the software, we can create a blockchain with a single line of code. And the software runs through the Windows command prompt, so I'll bring one up. Change to the uh, C directory and then to multi-chain directory. And do a dir just to make sure that we're in the right place. Everything looks great. Now, here's what we use to create a blockchain. It's the multichain-util.exe program. And I'm going to create a blockchain called MyChain. So it's this simple, multichain-util, space, create, space, and then the name of your blockchain. 
Okay, so we get a message telling us that the blockchain has been created, and there's some information there about where the parameters are located. So let's take a look at that. Um, I'm going to go to this folder. So the folder is, and it's listed right here in case you're wondering, right there. It's in the users folder, whatever your username is, app data, roaming. And there's a folder called multi-chain, which is automatically created when you create your first blockchain. I'll open that up and there's, uh, right here is our paramsdat file for the MyChain blockchain. Let's take a look. Now this contains all the settings and I'm not going to modify it, but as you become accustomed to multi-chain, you can tweak things here as needed. Just be aware of what you're doing when you make the changes. Okay, so I need two systems to do this. I've got two Windows 10 instances and both systems need to have multi-chain installed. I've already installed multi-chain on the second system, so now we can initialize the blockchain we just created on this system, system 1. We use multi-chain D for daemon to initialize it, and then we have to start the uh, daemon using the, uh, the name of the blockchain, my chain, and then dash daemon is the switch, and press enter. Okay, we got some feedback. Now, note that this command not only initializes the blockchain, but it also mines the very first block, and that's the Genesis block. The feedback tells us this, and we get a node address right there uh, that can be used to connect to the blockchain. The format is the name of the blockchain, followed by the at symbol, the IP address of this system, and a port number. So I'll do a control C to copy that. Now, with the multi-chain server running, we can hop over to System 2. Okay, on System 2, I'll bring up the command line prompt. Same thing, I'm going to change to the uh, root directory and then to the multi-chain directory. And then Control-V to paste that command. So that has the IP address of the originating system plus the port number. Let's try that again. Okay, hang on a sec. Sorry about that. System's acting a little weird on me today. What the heck? Okay, just pretend that I... Uh, I'm going to try to type this. I'm having some problems. I don't know what's going on here. Let me just try this one more time. Edit, copy. Change to... There we go. Okay, I'll try this now. Okay, so we got some feedback here. We've got the uh, feedback telling us that the node has been connected, the blockchain was successfully initialized, and then we have some information here. Please ask blockchain admin or user having activate permission to let you connect and, and or transact. So we've got two different um, lines here. We've got this one, and this allows connections, but it doesn't allow full access to the blockchain on system one. And this one does. This is the one I want because that'll just make life easier. So I'll control C to copy that. So we've got our wallet ID here beginning with one. And what I want to do is go back to system one and enter this entire line that we, uh, that we just copied. So let's go back to system one. Okay, now here, because the daemon is running inside this command line window, we need to open a second one. We don't want to close that command line window because it was shut down the daemon. And then just control V to paste that entire line. And it would help if I was in the right folder, so let's do that. And try it again. Okay, so we get a little bit of feedback here, including this hash right here. Now we don't have to do anything with that right now. What we want to do is go back to system two. Because now that we've granted permissions from the originating system for the system I'm using right here, uh, let's go ahead and type this, multi-chain D dash daemon. Okay, um, how can I undo what I just did there? Let's try this. Um, okay, so when we go back to the system, let's start here. Okay, and I'll just run that again. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, it'll work. Okay, so back in System 2, 
Looks like I lost my command line window, so I'll run it again. Change to uh, the root directory and then to the multi-chain directory. And we want to run the multi-chain daemon on this system as well. So multi-chain D, uh, my chain, the name of the blockchain, and then daemon. Okay, and we're getting the same feedback or similar feedback that we uh, did from system one. But the difference here is we're getting this information right here. We're actually showing that we're connected to system one, to that, uh, to that blockchain. And down here, uh, that other nodes, if, they want, if we want to, we can connect to this system, which is now running the daemon as well, using the IP address of this system and the port number 7175. So at this point, your blockchain is up and running and ready to process transactions. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to obtain information about a multi-chain blockchain using the command line. I have a blockchain called MyChain running on two nodes. Both nodes are running the multi-chain daemon. Before I create my first transaction, I want to step through some of the commands you can run on the blockchain using the multi-chain dash CLI command. So it looks like this, multi-chain dash CLI. Now, this one will provide general information on the blockchain called MyChain. So we put in the name of the blockchain and get info. And this will give us all the information about the, uh, the blockchain that we're running. Now, we can also review a list of all available commands for this blockchain. And what I'm going to do is uh, just highlight this, copy it to the clipboard, because you have to type that in every time. This just saves a little bit of time. So we want to retrieve some help. And that gives us all sorts of information about uh, what we can do with uh, multi-chain on this blockchain. And we can also retrieve the parameters of this uh, blockchain. So it's uh, get blockchain params. And this will detail the parameters for the specific blockchain that we can modify uh, in the uh, params file if we need to. Now we can also look at assign permissions. Now this will show us who has or what nodes have permission to this. Now, it looks like there are a lot of nodes there, but in fact, if we look at the address, we're only seeing two unique addresses. So this one and this one right here. So uh, these are just multiple instances of the same uh, uh, nodes attached to the blockchain. In this case, there are only two nodes attached and only two sets of permissions. Now we can also create a, a new address in the wallet. Now we can also list all the addresses in the wallet. And at this point, we've just got the one single address right there. And we can also create new addresses in the wallet. So, okay, you can see that this one, the, the new one we just created, is different than this one. So if, I, so if I bring back that prior command, get addresses, you can see the address now has changed to this. Now, finally, we can view a list of connected peers for each node. And this is kind of interesting. I'll paste that in and use get peer info. Okay, now this gives us information on the peers attached to this blockchain. Now, note that this shows us the IP address for System 2. Right now, I'm on System 1. So remember, a blockchain is decentralized, and no one node owns the blockchain, and every node has a copy of the blockchain. So running this command on System 2 should show us the IP address for this system. So let's go to System 2 and see if that's the case. Remember, this one is 192. 168.1.182. Okay, let's try running that command again. Get peer info on system two. Okay, you can see that the IP address for the peer that's attached to this blockchain is different. That's the IP address for system one. So remember, this system has a copy of the blockchain ledger two, and we can get information that displays the IP address for system one. And if we had more nodes attached, we would see the IP addresses or entries for each uh, node and the IP addresses would be for those systems. And the only thing we wouldn't see on this particular system is the IP address for this system because this is showing us the connected nodes to the blockchain. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to test blockchain operability by creating a blockchain transaction. I have a blockchain called MyChain and two systems with both nodes running the multi-chain daemon. And I want to create my first blockchain transaction. I'll start by obtaining the address of systems that have permissions to create assets. So I'll use multi-chain 
dash CLI for client, followed by the name of the blockchain, list permissions, space, issue. Now at this point, we get the address for creating asset, and it begins with the number one. And what I want to do is highlight that, everything except the quotation marks, and copy it to the clipboard with control C. Now I want to create a new asset on this node, system one. And let's pretend that we're dealing with cryptocurrency. So I'm going to give it 500 units using multi-chain dash CLI space, the name of the blockchain issue, paste in that wallet address, followed by a space, my money. So that's the name that we're going to give our cryptocurrency. Another space, 500. That's the amount of units of my money that we're going to give the wallet another space, and 0 0.01. Now that last number, 0 0.01, is how we're going to subdivide the uh, currency, so into 100 units, just like regular currency. So we don't just have to give full uh, units of cryptocurrency, like one, we can actually give it one one hundredth, which would be a penny in, if we're dealing with dollars, for example. Okay, so we get some feedback here, and a hash value. The transaction apparently has been created, but Let's check and make sure it has indeed been created and added to the wallet. And we're going to do that in both nodes because both nodes contain the blockchain ledger. I'll start with this system. Multi-chain dash CLI. My chain list assets. Okay, you can see that we have our currency called my money and there are 500 units of my money. Now keep in mind, this is what's contained in the blockchain ledger. And if I run this on system two, we'll see the same result. We're seeing what's in the ledger, not necessarily what this system owns. So let's check and see how much money is actually in this system's wallet. So now for that, I'll use multi-chain dash CLI space my chain space get total balances. Okay, so in the wallet on system one, we've got 500 units of my money. Let's check system two. Okay, I'm going to start by listing the assets first. Remember, the assets in the ledger are not the same as, the, as what's owned by the, uh, the wallet in this system. So, uh, multi-chain dash CLI space my chain list assets. Okay, so we get the same result as we saw in system one. We're seeing what's in the ledger. We have our currency, my money, and 500 units being uh, in the ledger. But we want to see how much this system owns and how much is in the wallet. So I'll use the same command I used on the other system, multi-chain dash CLI space my chain space get total balances. Okay, so here we get a different result. You can see that there's nothing in here. We don't see anything because there's nothing in the wallet on this system. Now, before I go back to system one and create a transaction, I need to get the wallet address for this system because I'll need it to send this system money. So I'm going to use this command to list addresses for the wallet. Multi-chain dash CLI space my chain space get addresses. And we get one result right here. Okay, so this is the address for the wallet for the system. I'll highlight that again, everything but the quotation marks and use control C to copy that. So let's go back to system one and create our transaction. Okay, I want to send 50 units of my money to system two. I'll use system two's wallet address, the one I just copied. And it looks like this, multi-chain dash CLI space, my chain space, send asset. At this point, I uh, paste in the wallet address for system two, followed by a space, and then list the asset my money, followed by a space, and then 50. So the number of units we're going to send to uh, System 2's wallet. Okay, so we get a little bit of feedback here. We get a transaction hash. There's been no errors, so everything looks good at this point. Let's check out the System's wallet and see uh, what it looks like now. Multi-chain-CLI, space, my chain, get total balances. All right, okay, we're starting to see something happen here. Now we've only got 450 units of my money in this system's wallet. And that tells us that the transaction probably went well, but let's go back to system two and verify that. Okay, so back on system two, let's run that same command, multi-chain dash CLI space my chain space get total.
balances. All right, so there you have it. We now have 50 units of my money in the wallet of system number two. So that was pretty straightforward and easy. And note that we didn't use a method like proof of work to validate the transaction. Multi-chain's code base does support proof of work. And when you get into developing blockchains with multi-chain, you can certainly bake that into your code. And when you start getting into large numbers of nodes and performing consensus validations like proof of work, things become more complex. But now that you've created your first blockchain, you can begin to build it out and explore the possibilities. In this video, I'll discuss the various testing tools for blockchain technologies. When you're testing a blockchain, there's some helpful information you should test for. First is load, and that means load on the blockchain system. This is a critical one because blockchain operates differently than your standard network application paradigm. Transactions must be validated by the blockchain, and that in itself requires a large amount of processing. The more transactions being requested can put an incremental burden on a blockchain directly affecting performance. So you have to test for load to see how much you can throw at your blockchain. Block size in blockchain is limited to one megabyte. The more transactions being recorded means larger block sizes. Bitcoin, for example, recently closed in on the one megabyte threshold, and we're not sure what will happen if and when this maxes out. Chain size is also important. Remember, the chain contains every transaction since the beginning of time, and there's no physical limit on the chain. But what happens as it gets very large? At current count, the Bitcoin blockchain contains over a half million blocks since the beginning of time. Cryptography should be assessed, ensuring that the data is being properly protected and that private keys are kept private. This, of course, leads to security, but other considerations should be covered. For example, if you have a private blockchain, is your front-end user validation keeping the blockchain secure? Transmission of data and block addition are also important, ensuring that data is flowing freely and that blocks are being added as they should be and that the block integrity is being maintained. The test types you'll find in blockchain development are no different than in the standard software development paradigm, but it helps to build your testing plan around good practice. And so you should run a combination of manual and automated tests, tests of the API, even focus group tests, which really isn't in the realm of testing, but we'll talk about it anyway, when usability and functionality need to be assessed. Integration tests, unit tests, and testing of the user interface and user experience are also important components of the testing process, of the testing practice. And you'll be happy to know that there's plenty of testing tools out there for blockchain. These include Bitcoin J for the Bitcoin protocols, Corda testing tools, Embark framework, Ethereum, which has a great testing framework, Ethereum tester, Exonym test kit, Ganache, Hyperledger composer, Manticore, Populous and Truffle, to name just a few. In this video, I'll discuss the various best practices for testing blockchains. Blockchain testing doesn't really vary from traditional software testing. Some of the tools may be proprietary and certain aspects of blockchain operation require special attention, but otherwise it's not that much different. There are some important best practices that apply to all software testing, and they should be considered best practices for blockchain testing as well. So let's take a look. First, locate and test your pain points. These become clear as you develop an application and begin to test functionality. Things like load and traffic are very important because blockchain can get quite large and complex. And that brings us to scaling. And it's not always easy to simulate scaling, especially with a paradigm like blockchains, but it's something you should plan for. Burn-in, referring to the initial proof of concept when a system is most likely to fail, should be performed. Usability testing, of course, should be performed. And if you can, test for future proofing. And this is normally directly related to size and scaling. Other best practices include researching your tools. There are plenty of robust blockchain testing tools, but try to find the right tool for the right job. And it's never a bad thing to adopt testing standards like ISTQB and ISEB. Finally, try everything. Balance manual and automated testing, and don't be afraid to run your blockchain through the gauntlet to ensure that when it does go live, it has the greatest chance of success.
Now that you've learned about blockchain development and testing, it's time to put some of that knowledge to work. In this exercise, you'll describe blockchain development and testing. You'll explain why now is the time to adopt blockchain development. You'll describe the four basic blockchain concepts that new developers need to know. You'll list at least four programming languages that can be used in blockchain development. You'll list at least four blockchain development platforms. And you'll describe common test types used in blockchain development. At this point, you can pause this video and answer these questions. When you're done, resume the video to see how I would answer them. Okay, so let's answer these questions. It's okay if you didn't answer them the same way. First, explain why now is the time to adopt blockchain development. Well, first, it's nascent in the sense that uh, while it's been around for a while, really it's only been the last couple of years where it's started to branch out and, and away from uh, cryptocurrencies as being its main purpose. So it is much more than cryptocurrency, and there's currently a significant talent deficit, and that's normally a good sign that things are about to explode. Innovation is industry-driven, and we're still looking for change agents in the blockchain arena, and that's a really good time to get into a burgeoning new technology. Next, describe the four basic blockchain concepts that new developers need to know. Well, there are a few concepts that you'll need to know if you're going to take on blockchain. First, the ledger is the data repository, the database itself. In blockchain, there's no central authority, and that makes it more secure and less prone to tampering. It relies on consensus, the act of reaching an agreement. So at least 50% of participants need to agree before a blockchain is updated. And mining is a process of adding blocks. Next, list at least four programming languages that can be used in blockchain development. Well, there's a large number of common computer languages used in blockchain development or cryptography. These include C or C++, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, Node.js, Python, and Perl. Next, list at least four blockchain development platforms. Well, development platforms used to develop blockchain solutions include BigchainDB, Chaincore, Corda, Ethereum, Hydrachain, Hyperledger, IOTA Tangle, and Stellar. Finally, describe common test types used in blockchain development. Well, the test types you'll find in blockchain development are no different than in standard software development paradigms. You should run a combination of manual and automated tests, tests of the API, even focus group tests when usability and functionality need to be assessed, integration tests, unit tests, and testing of the user interface and user experience are also important components of the testing practice. I hope you found this exercise helpful. In this video, I'll discuss various blockchain case studies and how they suggest solutions for real-world applications. Let's start with the blockchain smart home, proposed in a paper by researchers at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. The idea is to establish a secure home environment for IoT devices using a blockchain. The problem that the researchers wanted to solve was the way blockchain consumes a great deal of energy. It takes processing time and it's very CPU intensive. The solution from the researchers was a lightweight blockchain stripped of the proof-of-work validation method. Their solution is based on three tiers, the cloud, the overlay, and the smart home itself. In this scenario, there's a miner that's always on, which controls and audits communication. The result was a home that was controllable but secured via blockchain. The researchers concluded that while the overheads associated with blockchain were an issue, the cost trade-off was acceptable when considering the security and privacy provided by the blockchain. The next case study is on electronic health records and research data, detailed in a paper by researchers at the MIT Media Lab and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. The problem, the requirements for compliance under existing laws and regulations, hinders innovation in the electronic health records arena. The solution, MedRec, a decentralized blockchain-based electronic health record system. The blockchain provides an immutable log and broad access to medical information. The stakeholders are the miners, people with a stake in the medical field like researchers and public health authorities who are incentivized to participate in the mining process. The MedRec solution handles authentication, confidentiality, accountability, and data sharing.
Next, there's the Brooklyn Microgrid, researched by principals at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and LO3 Energy, a Brooklyn-based company focused on blockchain solutions for the energy sector. The paper considers an increase in power generation from renewable distributed energy sources. The problem, the integration of this energy is very challenging for the existing energy system. The solution, those who generate the power could trade their self-produced energy in a peer-to-peer environment. They propose a blockchain-based microgrid energy market with the conclusion that the blockchain solution satisfies six of seven targeted components of the program, but existing regulations in many countries are an impediment to the seventh component, making local P2P energy markets unfeasible at this time. Then there's the Blockchain Intelligent Transportation System Study, conducted by researchers at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. The problem Legacy intelligent transportation systems are increasingly centralized and need to be modernized. The solution, a blockchain-based intelligent transportation system. It provides trusted architectures for parallel transportation management and blockchain-based real-time ride-sharing services. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain and innovation go hand in hand. Innovation and change go hand in hand, so let's talk for a moment about why people change. And for our purposes, we're thinking about both the people who make the things and the people who purchase the things. So why? Why do they change? Well, in part, innovation drives change because it either entices people or drags people to the next big thing. For example, I had this great smartphone that I purchased two years ago. I like big screens, so it was a phablet, part phone, part tablet. It was so big. But it seemed to me, almost overnight really, that this phone was a dinosaur. It was becoming bloated with software, and newer software that requires faster processors was coming out. I was constantly removing apps and rebooting the phone, and that essentially made it unusable to me. Now, the other day, I went out and bought the hottest new phone on the market. It's of a similar size, but... What I've noticed about the new phablets, most that I've researched anyway, is that manufacturers are making them slimmer. They have the same vertical height, but they're narrower. They're also super fast because they have the latest processors. I was drawn to the purchase, not by choice, but because I felt I had to. It feels smaller because it's narrower, even though it's the full 6.1 inches tall. So why are phones narrower? Well, I would suggest that it's because manufacturers have realized that usability is important, of course, and those big, fat, wide phones made it very difficult to operate with one hand. You couldn't touch the left side of the screen if you're holding it in your right hand. That's innovation. It's not a coincidence that today's phones are narrower. So what's the reason for innovation? Well, cost, efficiency, and performance, of course. Uh, innovation in tech usually means making things smaller and therefore cheaper. The modern smartphones have entire systems on a chip. The narrower size of the phone facilitates the operation of it with one hand, and that makes it more efficient. And as newer software offers more sophisticated features, we need smaller, better chips to make them perform within a reasonable level of operation. So adoption drives innovation. Me buying into the newer, faster, slimmer phone in a way validates what the innovators are doing. Likewise, innovation drives adoption. I now have a newer, faster, slimmer phone because that's the way the innovators made it, and in some ways, I didn't have much of a choice. I looked at a bunch of phones that didn't find any that were big and fat like the one I just ditched. In a real sense, the innovators made my decision for me. Now, innovation often requires a leader and or a leap of faith. Think back to some of the innovations that have appeared in our lifetimes. Think about Apple, for example. When you think about Apple and its many innovations, most people will also think about Woz and Jobs. They were linked to many of the company's innovations, the iPhone, iTunes, phones without audio jacks, the Apple Newton. Now, I threw that last one in because clearly innovation doesn't always have a happy ending, but it goes to the second point, the leap of faith, that someone took that leap. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And if you hear the phrase, why would they do that? It probably means you're on the right track. Innovation isn't always well received. Often people shake their head and wonder why. Why did you go and change my phone's width? I was okay with it the way it was. Why do we need a Betamax when we already have a VHS? Why Blu-ray? Why USB-C? You get the idea. Ideas like online gambling, charging 99 cents for a song instead of getting people to pay for albums, installing cameras and sensors in cities, 
running entire governments on blockchains, all ideas that have had their supporters and their detractors. So who's pushing blockchain innovation? Well, look no further than the Institute for Blockchain Innovation, which launched in May 2018 and has nearly 60 member organizations already. And industry recognizes the importance of blockchain. In fact, the fifth annual Blockchain Innovation Conference is occurring in Utrecht in 2018. The conference will have more than 400 participants from government and the corporate world, and this year's theme promises, from proof of concept to real-world solutions, the best blockchain cases in government, supply chain, fintech, energy, business, identity, ICOs, and more. In this video, I'll discuss how blockchain can transform your business by providing secure and irrefutable transactions. Here are some existing blockchain applications that may help transform your business. Cryptocurrency. Don't dismiss the ability of cryptocurrency to provide novel and effective ways to improve your services or products. One example that comes to mind is Burger King, which created a cryptocurrency called WhopperCoin. Patrons in Russia can collect Whopper coins for their purchases and then redeem them or trade them. Other examples of cryptocurrency-related offerings that companies are already using include Bitcoin gift cards, airline loyalty programs, fast food companies, as in the Burger King example, and even online gambling. There's already a number of blockchain-based online gambling sites. Current uses of blockchain, uses that are already being done that may be worth adopting now, include money transfers, smart contracts, secure records, supply chain management, cloud storage, sensor technology, and identification and security. And because these are existing applications, it may be the case that you can purchase an already built solution rather than building it yourself. So which way do you go? Like any other business decision, you have to decide what works for you. But before you do go ahead and build a solution, it might be prudent to research what's already available and weigh the costs of purchase versus the costs of development. Whichever way you decide to go, there are a few things you should consider when planning a blockchain implementation. First, focus on blockchain's obvious strengths. The distributed ledger, mutual consensus, and security are the three jewels in the blockchain crown, and they're the reason you want a blockchain, so ensure that you leverage every ounce of them. And you should address the security concerns that may give you pause when considering the blockchain plunge. The past hacks and fraud associated with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin don't represent the future of blockchain, but they should still be considered to give your senior management comfort that these events were Bitcoin-based, not blockchain-based, and to learn from the mistakes of the past. Now, this one's going to be controversial depending on who you talk to, but don't think about money. A solution like blockchain, when properly implemented, will reap its own rewards. A subpar effort could be disastrous. So budgeting and planning have to be liberal in their flexibility. And remember to educate the marketplace, consumers, stakeholders, investors, suppliers. Tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it, with emphasis on the value that a blockchain solution will bring them. In this video, I'll discuss the basic steps for beginning a transformation to blockchain technology. When you begin the blockchain transformation, that is, the earliest moments, there will be two things you need to proceed. First, you need buy-in from the C-suite and from the users, both internal users and external users. And you need to understand and to impart understanding on others, understanding the technology, understanding the implications, and understanding the opportunities are the three pillars where if you can't understand or explain to others, you can't implement. And think about this quote, the depths of blockchain won't be understood by the masses ever. While there's truth in those words, you can still describe the surface and impart understanding. And you have to identify the opportunities, whether it's in cryptocurrency, smart contracts, a general database, or something else. Map out the scope of your blockchain plan. And determine the rationale. Why are you doing this? Is it to lower costs, to provide better products or services, to enhance efficiency, to improve security and privacy? Is it to attract more customers? Can a blockchain solution even do that? Next, determine whether you'll develop or buy a solution. You may wish to build on open source platforms or purchase from a known vendor. There are obvious benefits to each, but it really depends on what you plan on doing with blockchain. And you have to choose your blockchain type. Will it be public or restricted? If you plan on restricting access for some but not for others, 
you may need a hybrid solution. And if you plan on working with other organizations or groups, you may need a federated or consortium model. And you may want to consider a public permission blockchain where users are invited and require credentials in order to proceed. You also have to choose your target platform. Will the products be desktop-based through web access, and will there be a mobile version? Finally, choose your connectivity. Will this be an online blockchain or offline? By that, of course, I mean, will assets be available offline? In Bitcoin, for example, you can store your private keys offline. In this video, I'll discuss ways in which blockchain can provide cost savings for organizations. So how can blockchain save your business money? Well, there's enhanced or newfound efficiencies. For example, the efficiencies that can be found in supply chain management. Blockchain can facilitate better processes, for example, enhancing your sales force. Of course, there's improved security and privacy, which can save a lot of money in lost customers or litigation. So just the value of an improved reputation is priceless. There's cost reductions, the type you might find in eliminating the middlemen, which is one of blockchain's strengths. Additionally, there are other possible cost-saving measures. Blockchain payroll systems are already a reality. Virtual banking can have cost-saving benefits. Commodities transactions with blockchain eliminate the middleman and provide instant change in ownership. There may be reduced transaction fees associated with banking, credit card processing, and so on. Again, transactions are instant and ownership transfer is immediate. And through consensus, blockchain can provide better decision-making that may result in massive savings. In this video, I'll discuss the ways in which blockchain may be affecting our lives and the way we do business in the future. I don't have a crystal ball, but I'll give it a shot anyway. What does the future look like for blockchain? We can use the present along with some projections to paint a rosy picture for this transformational technology called blockchain. Growth is expected to grow by 42% by 2020. And just glancing at the present, cryptocurrency in 2018 is worth $600 billion. Blockchain jobs have tripled between 2017 and 2018, and spending on blockchain was $2.1 billion in 2018. VC funding for blockchain businesses represented 40% of the previous year's total. And right now, there are more than 2,100 blockchain startups. The future looks very bright for blockchain. But it's still early. Use cases for blockchain technologies are relatively nascent, with Bitcoin being the obvious one, smart contracts attracting a lot of attention, and data storage solutions having already been introduced to the world. Even though I use the word nascent, I believe that we're currently seeing that change, and I don't think we can use that word much longer. Nevertheless, real opportunity needs champions, the early adopters, the pioneers, the change agents and thought leaders. We can never have enough of those. And any blockchain implementation should focus on data because it provides a complete and irrefutable record. It stores immutable data. It can't be changed. And it provides the ability to view data properties without revealing sensitive information. As for where blockchain may organically grow, it may be able to eliminate trusted third parties. For example, in title searches, it could be used to protect things that must be protected, not just data, but objects themselves, like self-driving cars. And it has the ability to create a more secure internet. Think about it. The technology has been around for 10 years, out there in the ether, and it's never been hacked. And a reminder, because someone will always ask, Bitcoin has been hacked, blockchain hasn't. Now, blockchain may be a major player in digital advertising with the opportunity of eliminating bad actors, spammers, and the like. It could be a player in streaming money, facilitating micropayments, for identification, things like digital identity, passports, certificates, and so on. And it could be more effective in bolstering democracy with secured voting. We're seeing all of these applications, whether on the drawing board or actually out there being done, and it's only a matter of time before the future decides where blockchain is going to go. In this video, I'll discuss the potential problems of relying too heavily on blockchain in the future. Blockchain could be the tech of the future, but what if it isn't? Detractors will go for the low-hanging fruit by saying that there's simply too much love for blockchain. It's just a fad. And I say this all the time because it's true. Blockchain isn't a panacea. It's not a cure-all for all of our tech woes. 
And even after 10 years, it can still be regarded as nascent technology, although that's changing rapidly. Nevertheless, it hasn't been fully vetted against the problems it seeks to solve. The only solution to that is time. We've already seen the way blockchain can affect culture through cryptocurrency. Volatility, Bitcoin forks, where the cryptocurrency diverges in two different directions due to a number of reasons, including disagreements in the way forward. Hard Bitcoin forks occurred in 2017 when Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Gold appeared, and in 2018 with Bitcoin Private. In a hard fork, the blockchain rules change for each party, and while the blockchain shares ledger transactions from the beginning of time, the ledgers differ from the point when the blockchain forked. Then, of course, there's still the 51% problem, where bad actors could theoretically take over a blockchain with at least 51% of the nodes and therefore control consensus. And there have been abuses of blockchain, and that's not really fair because they were through Bitcoin, and it's not really the fault of blockchain. Cryptocurrency hacks tend to be fairly frequent. Between 2015 and 2017 alone, over $400 million has been stolen from several hundred initial coin offerings through hacks. The darknet has given Bitcoin a bit of a black eye because it's become the preferred payment for illicit activities. The most notorious of these was Silk Road, a darknet marketplace that sold, among other things, illicit drugs. Silk Road was shut down by the American FBI in 2013, and its creator was arrested and later sentenced to life in prison. Mt. Gox is probably the most infamous Bitcoin hack. It was a Japanese Bitcoin exchange and was hacked twice, first in 2011 and then in 2014. Mt. Gox filed for bankruptcy not long after the second hack, reporting that they lost over $350 million. Arms dealers have been known to deal in Bitcoin because its secure nature makes it difficult for law enforcement agencies to track and even terrorist organizations. So here's what needs to happen if blockchain is to become the future. Standardization is underway, sort of. It's a more organic process right now with certain organizations leading the pack in their platforms. The more companies that adopt these platforms, the closer we'll get to standards as the outliers drop away. That's my opinion anyway. But there is a regulatory vacuum with some regulations appearing around Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. The problem is that there's little consistency among nations, and until regulations catch up, blockchain may be at risk of being all over the map. And collaboration isn't easy. Different organizations have different KPIs, different directions, although we are seeing some encouraging collaboration occurring in various sectors, including energy and financial services. Then there are scalability issues. Bitcoin in particular has helped to show what happens as the blockchain grows but we have no idea what it will look like with other industries and other applications, especially in scenarios where high availability is critical, like the healthcare sector, for example. There are potential speed issues, although organizations appear to be finding ways around the proof-of-work issue. Public perception is always going to be a monumental issue. Do the past issues surrounding cryptocurrencies make blockchain a liability in the public eye? That remains to be seen, but are we one major hack away from becoming a pariah? That's always a risk. And there may be pushback from organizations that will be affected by blockchain adoption. Right now, that appears to be the middlemen, the intermediaries whose services are put at risk by blockchain, which can operate without the need for middlemen. Now that you've learned about blockchain and business, it's time to put some of that knowledge to work. In this exercise, you'll discuss blockchain and business. You'll discuss what's needed for innovation. You'll explain blockchain uses that might be worth adopting now. You'll describe what can be done to enact change. You'll explain the first two things you need to proceed with blockchain. You'll explain the ways in which blockchain can save an organization money. And you'll discuss well-known blockchain abuses. At this point, you can pause this video and answer these questions. Once you're done, resume the video to see how I would answer them. Okay, let's answer these questions. It's okay if you didn't answer them the same way. First, discuss what's needed for innovation. Well, innovation sometimes requires a leader and a leap of faith. And remember that if people are asking, why would they do that? It probably means you're on the right track. Organizations that have taken on or plan to take on blockchain solutions include online gambling, the music industry, smart cities, and even entire governments. Next, explain blockchain uses that might be worth adopting now. 
Well, current uses that may be worth adopting now include money transfers, smart contracts, secure records, supply chain management, cloud storage, sensor technologies, and identification and security. Next, describe what can be done to enact change. Well, first, focus on blockchain's obvious strengths, the distributed ledger, mutual consensus, and security. Also, address security concerns. Past hacks and frauds aren't a future indicator of what will happen, but they certainly can help in understanding what happened to avoid it in the future. Nevertheless, they are helpful in understanding what happened and avoiding it in the future. Stop thinking about money. You know, I know that's a, a contentious one for some people, but the idea here is that if you're going to go with blockchain, you have to make sure that you do it right. And educate the marketplace. So that's consumers, investors, organizations, everybody involved. You have to explain to them the value proposition and why your solution is going to work for them. Next, explain the first two things you need to proceed with blockchain. Well, the first two things you need to proceed are buy-in, and that's buy-in from the C-level and buy-in from the users, both internal and external. And also understanding and imparting an understanding. So understanding the technology, the implications, and the opportunities, and making sure that not only do you and your team understand it, but that the people who are going to benefit from this understand it. Next, explain the ways in which blockchain can save an organization money. Well, there are plenty of ways, but really greater or newfound efficiencies, for example, in supply chain management, uh, better processes, for example, in your sales organization, for improved security and privacy and the cost savings that are associated with that, including the benefits of having an improved reputation. And then there's cost reduction, things like eliminating the middlemen, which blockchain is very good at. Finally, discuss well-known blockchain abuses. Other cost-saving measures include payroll, virtual banking, commodities transactions, reduced transaction fees, things like fees associated with banking, credit card processing, and so on, instant transactions where ownership transfer is immediate, and better decision-making through consensus. Finally, discuss well-known blockchain abuses. Well, there have been a number of abuses of blockchain, although they were abuses of Bitcoin and not really the fault of blockchain. Uh, cryptocurrency hacks tend to be fairly frequent. On the dark net, cryptocurrency has become the preferred payment for illicit activities. The most notorious of these was Silk Road, a dark net marketplace that sold illicit drugs. Mt. Gox was a Japanese Bitcoin exchange and was hacked twice, reporting that they'd lost over $350 million. Arms dealers have been known to deal in Bitcoin because it's secure and makes it difficult for law enforcement agencies to track, and even terrorist organizations are using cryptocurrency. I hope you found this exercise helpful.